was planning a bank robbery with these dudes I hired online. They claim to be ex-criminals, so it's going to be a big haul. We identified the subject, ran through the script one more time, and then headed to the bank. But when we got there, <gasps> I was speechless! Hi, my name is Jolie. Wondering how I ended up robbing a bank? Come on, I'll take you on a wild ride. I come from a happy family with a mom and dad who always shower me with unconditional love. In fact, they were so perfect, I don't think they'd ever argued about anything. Growing up, I was taught to be a good person and prioritize school for future careers. I did just that, and they were so proud. But then one day, I came home to shocking news. Mom and dad were getting divorced. But why? Honey, this was the best for both of us. We're just not that compatible. Not compatible? Did you just figure it out overnight? Sweetie, I know this is hard, but we're gonna be okay, I promise. No, we're not! We're a broken family and you just act like it's nothing! Do you even care at all? Days later, I still couldn't get my mind off it, until I passed by this restaurant and saw a familiar figure. Was it Dad? Holding hands with a strange woman? What the freak? Dad's been cheating on Mom? I immediately dashed home to tell Mom, but when I got there, I didn't have the heart to break it to her. Mom, you okay? Um, it's just that the divorce has been hard on me. I respect your dad's decision, but this is really hard for me. You're the only family I got now, Jolie. No, she's wrong. I won't let her be this brooding ex-wife of dad. I'm gonna get him back to her, once he sees how his beloved daughter is being affected by this divorce. So the next day, I went to the park and picked the flowers in public. Well, not exactly, but it's bad, right? Then I crossed the street, when the sign said stop, but the policeman didn't even bat an eye. Hello? I'm breaking the law over here. Okay then, Mr. Whitman's restaurant we go. I didn't order anything, but just drew all over his wall, in chalk. Well, you don't want it to stay forever, right? But Mr. Whitman appeared and thanked me instead, as I gave him the best ideas to keep the kids entertained while eating in his restaurant. Ugh. Frustrated, I read the whole book at the bookstore without paying, littered in public, and even kicked some trash cans over, but nobody seemed to acknowledge my bad deeds. So I binge-watched some crime movies to activate my evilness. Aha! A robbery! That's why I hired those idiots! Gold Beach Bank and Trust! Not Gold Beach the Hat Shop, you imbecile! Sorry, my mistake! We went ahead with the robbery anyway and managed to steal a bunch of hats, and I made sure to accidentally drop my wallet with my ID inside. The next day, I came home from school to see the store's owner raging at Dad, accusing him of bad parenting. <laughs> but Dad stayed oddly calm and just paid for all the hats I stole. What? Go get ready. You and I are going to dine out tonight. There's someone I want you to meet. Let me guess. It's the side chick I saw the other day. Jolie, this is... Aurora. I'm your dad's friend. Aurora, we should tell her. Oh, drop it! I knew already! You two have been having an affair, haven't you? Jolie, watch your words! Why? Because it's the truth? Dad was about to say something, but Aurora stopped him. I can't believe you'd do this to Mom! I ran out of there and hid in this alley, crying with an aching heart, when I spotted some guys looking sketchy. They had a suitcase full of money and kept looking around cautiously. Suddenly, I stepped on a squishy, and it made the loudest noise and got them all to turn towards my direction. I immediately ran away before they spotted me and bumped into someone. Who's that? Show yourself! The guy instantly understood the situation and hid me away. Just a cat, Lalo. After the gang left, I stepped out to thank him. And my, my, such a heartthrob. I was going to offer to repay him, but he just brushed it off and walked away. So freaking cool! Later, I got home and saw Mom packing. She said she'd move out soon. And Dad didn't even stop her. Suddenly, I noticed something. Pictures of Mom and... Aurora! Mom, you know this woman? Aurora? Yeah, we've been friends since middle school. Friends? She's not your friend! She and Dad have been having an affair behind your back! It's really over, isn't it? No, Mom! You need to stand up for yourself! If you don't do anything, then I will! There's only one way now. Get the school involved. If they see a straight-A student like me suddenly turn rebellious, they'll talk some sense into Dad, right? But of course, I need to make sure my bad deeds are legit this time. Suddenly, I notice everyone buzzing around. Oh my god, did you hear? We got a new transfer student, and he's got such a bad boy vibe. Tell me about it. He's been the hottest topic ever since he got here. Oh my god, he's coming this way. I turned around, and my jaw dropped. It was the guy I met yesterday. Suddenly headed straight to me. There you are. You're looking for me? No, but I'm just tired of people surrounding me. Let's get out of here. So, transfer student, huh? What happened to your hair? Just thought I'd change it up a little. You know, more appropriate for school. Wait, aren't you like some kind of bad boy? Why are you following the rules? 
I got a bit of a reputation, but I'm ready to change my ways. No, good guys finish last, didn't you hear? That's why I'm trying to change too, to spice things up a bit. So please, teach me to be a delinquent. If you wanted that bad, then sure. Yay, thank you, you're gorgeous man. Ooh, and a jacked bod too. Tyler and I started my new rebellious plan. Okay, show me what you got. I immediately went straight to a group of nerds, slammed my hand on the table and snatched a guy's burger and started mooching off it. Here's some fries, did your parents starve you? No! I immediately stood up and left, and saw Tyler, who was laughing at me hysterically. <laughs> that's your idea of being mean? I know I'm bad, that's why I need you to enlighten me. Tyler then taught me some pranks, and it was hilarious! We kept the door shut with 20 different locks and enjoyed seeing the teacher struggling to crack them all open, got the screen to show a bunch of memes during class, then played a bell ringing sound every 15 minutes, confusing everyone. The cherry on top was to get loads of adult diapers shipped to our beloved principal, cash on delivery. <laughs> when the principal asked who did it, I proudly took the fall. Do you care to explain yourself? Principal, I feel like bad right now, but that's because, because my parents are getting divorced. <laughs> I can't eat, can't sleep, my mind's a mess. All right, I get it. Jesus. I'll have a talk to your parents. You can leave now. Father dearest, let's see how you handle this. When I got out, Tyler was waiting for me. He drove me away, then stopped by this gorgeous lake. You didn't just rebel because you were bored, right? I sighed, then started pouring it all out that had been bottling up inside of me. Guess having a normal family is luxury to both of us. What do you mean? I actually grew up in an orphanage, but I wasn't happy there, so I ran away. I ended up on the streets and causing trouble. Luckily for me, my foster dad noticed and adopted me. I'm extremely grateful to this day, so I'm always looking to help him with the business. Your dad has a business? What does he do? Tyler didn't answer me. When we got back, Aurora was already there waiting for me. What are you doing here? Your dad went on a business trip and asked me to come over to look out for you for a few days. No, thank you. I can look out for myself. And who is this young man? Have we met before? Would you please stop poking your nose into my business? Can't believe dad still went ahead with the divorce after meeting with the principal. And now I'm stuck here with this annoying woman. Just wouldn't let me leave the house and even ordered this rubbish dusk till dawn curfew on me. You're not going to see that guy. He's trouble. Please, you're not my mom. So I continued meeting up with Tyler. But strangely, whenever I suggested we hang out at his place, he always seemed hesitant. So one time I went to his house to surprise him. But upon seeing me, he looked so worried. What are you doing here? You're not supposed to come here. We have a guest today. I turned around and was transfixed to see the sketchy guy from the alley. Lalo, I'm Tyler's dad. You must be... J J Jolie. Oh, right. Jolie. Tyler told me lots about you. Come on in. Be my guest. But Tyler pulled me out of there. We stopped at a nearby park when he finally loosened up a little. That man was your foster dad? Yeah. I just couldn't tell you the truth. I'm afraid you wouldn't want me around anymore. That's not true. You don't get it. He's running an illicit business and now he's asking me to take over. I know I'm deeply indebted to him, but I don't want to do anything illegal. Then don't. Just because he brings you up doesn't mean you have to do everything by his orders. Especially breaking the laws, right? Tyler nodded, but still seemed troubled. That evening, Tyler was driving me back home when I suddenly saw a familiar face. I told him to drop me off there. Inside, Aurora was sitting side by side with a man, both looking all dressed up. Across the table was another person. What was she up to? I'm telling you, this pair of top-notch diamond rings is perfect for your wedding. Right, we only want the best for our wedding. Right, babe? Wedding? Those two? She's two-timing my dad! I quickly recorded their conversation and went home. Dad should be back tonight from his business trip. But when I told dad everything, even with the recording, he still wouldn't believe me. What are you talking about? I was just out shopping all day with my friends. Told you so. Dad, you'll regret this deeply. And you, don't even think you could get away with this! I'll never accept you into this family! Tomorrow, the court will decide who I'm going to stay with. I know just what to do. I can't be in this house any longer. At the court, I stood up, to everyone's surprise, and spoke about how I got mistreated at home with Dad and Aurora, and asked to stay with my mom. The judge then asked Mom what she thought. I... I'm not so sure. Jolie... should just stay with her dad. I was completely disappointed. Mom wouldn't even fight for me. When we got home, Dad immediately went bonkers on me while Aurora pulled off her nice act again. Right then, I got a text from Tyler asking to meet up, so I just stormed out of there. 
No, Jolie, wait up! When I arrived, Tyler looked surprised. Jolie, what are you doing here? Miho, I used your phone to ask her to come here. Lalo then ordered his gang to tie me up. I was struggling to get away when someone rushed towards us. Lalo! Wait, Aurora? She knew this gangster? Release her now, or the police will get here any minute. Thanks for the intel, Miss DEA agent. We're about to leave. With your daughter, of course. Now if you want to save her, fill in the place. DEA agent? As in, undercover cop? Fine, take me instead. Lalo's gang tied her up and pushed her into the van. <laughs> That's right. Boys, take this brat too. We can't spare any witnesses on the scene. We had a deal, Lalo. Really? Didn't ring a bell. He ordered Tyler to drive away while the police siren was getting louder. Suddenly, Tyler took a turn. What are you doing? That is not the way! While they were distracted, Aurora slipped out the multi-tools in her pocket and started cutting the ropes around my hands. I did the same to her. Tyler then made a sudden stop. Lalo and the gang lost his balance and fell to the floor. The police immediately surrounded the van and captured these criminals. Jolie, you were right. You didn't get hurt anywhere, right? Yeah, thank you for saving me. And... I'm sorry for acting so rude. It's just, I'm not ready to move on from the divorce yet. Sweetie, there's something really important I want to tell you. I'm your biological mother. What are you saying? Jean is my biological mother. No, sweetie. She's a friend of mine. I know this is all confusing, but just listen. Sixteen years ago, your dad and I had you. Right after giving birth, I had to move to Mexico to handle a serial diamond smuggling case caused by Lalo. And Jean offered to help out with you. I figured you deserve a normal, happy family, so I accepted her help and asked her to move to our house. Years later, thinking the case was finally closed, I moved back home, ready to reunite with you and your dad. But I suddenly got the news Lalo's organization was still operating and had to move to the States. I couldn't risk putting you in danger, so I hid the truth from you. But what about the person who talked about the wedding with you? Oh, that's Alejandro, my partner. We were just pretending to be a couple for the investigation. Oh, I I had no idea. You'd done so much for me. Of course, you're my daughter. Thank you, Mom. Finally, everything became clear. But as we got to the house, Mom, I mean Jean, suddenly came dragging me away. You're my daughter. No one gets to take you away from me. Just because you raised Jolie doesn't mean you get to do anything to her. If you truly love her, you would only want the best for her. Jean then broke down crying, revealing she had lost her reproductive ability. She was so happy she had me to take care of and treated me like her own daughter. Hey, don't worry. You'll forever be my mom. I gave Jean the biggest hugs. That's when I noticed Tyler was happy for me, but sad at the same time. I suddenly realized he didn't have a family anymore. I have an idea. Why don't you adopt Tyler into your home? Tyler and Jean looked at each other, and bright smiles appeared on their faces. Everything finally turned out to be okay. I've been trying to catch up with mom and make up for all those lost years, but I also don't forget my second mom either. Tyler, or should I say my boyfriend, now lives with Jean and he's driving me to visit her. I'm so happy I finally have a loving family and a baddie boyfriend. Only this time, we're not trying to break bad anymore. Have you ever questioned if your teacher hates you? I wish I didn't have to, but yep, my teacher hated my guts, and she went out of her way to make it very clear. I'm Lori, by the way. I'm 15 years old, and I guess you could say I kind of stand out because of my looks. People say I'm kind of pretty. Anyway, this year I started high school, although I only joined halfway through the year because I was off sick for six months with glandular fever. Yep, I had the dreaded mono. I was so tired of lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, so when the doctor said I could finally go back to school, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was in store for me. On my first day, I had to show all my teachers my hospital certificate to explain why I'd missed so much of the year. When I gave it to Miss Atkin, my math teacher, she smiled and said, Welcome. Nice to see you feeling so much better. I smiled back at her and said, Thank you. And I was about to walk away when suddenly she said, Excuse me, you're Lori Hannison? Her face looked all weird, and when I told her, Yep, that was me, Something inside her changed. She gave me a cold stare and told me to go to my seat immediately. I was confused a little bit about her attitude, but then I moved on from it. The most important thing was how I could catch up with my class. 
After missing six months of math, I was super behind and couldn't understand anything. My mom had to hire a tutor for me, and he was such a good teacher. Only after three months, I finally caught up with them. I had a notebook from our sessions with lots of notes inside, and whenever I couldn't remember something, I'd just look at it. Well, one day, I had it on my desk at school, and Miss Atkin caught me seeing my notes. She marched towards me, grabbed it, and slammed it down in front of me. She was so angry and got right up in my face and said, Never, ever bring another teacher's notes to my class. Do you hear me? As she said that, a little bit of spit flew out of her mouth and landed on my nose. I was horrified. Why was she so angry at me? It kind of scared me, and I thought maybe she was just angry because I wasn't as good at math as everyone else. After that, I didn't dare bring my notebook to class, but sometimes I still struggled, so I'd ask my friend who sat nearby to help me. Miss Atkin always caught me asking her and would put me in detention. One time I just sneezed too loud and she gave me detention. I mean, can you even believe? It annoyed me so much that I started to rebel. I'd often fall asleep in her class and I seriously lost all motivation to do well. And that's not all. One day I wore a new dress to class and I swear I looked exactly like all the other girls at school. But Miss Atkin publicly embarrassed me by making me stand up in front of everyone, then said, Girls and boys, Lori is a fine example of someone who pays more attention to what she wears than to studying. Don't be like Lori. I could feel myself blushing and I wanted to cry. She was deliberately being mean to me and I had no idea why. I was not that kind of girl. I normally loved studying, and I didn't care about clothes and shoes at all. I couldn't say anything, though, because if I spoke back to her, she'd give me a worse grade. What made it all even worse was that she was also the cheerleading coach, and she had her pack of cheerleaders following her around everywhere. One time I was standing in the hall talking with my friend Joe. We'd been best friends since we were like three years old, and we also live in the same street, so we'd grown up together. Joe always had my back. So we were standing there chatting when Miss Atkin and some of her fave students walked by. Suddenly I heard one of the girls say, Oh look, surprise, surprise. It's Lori flirting with a boy again. Then one of the other girls said, Seriously, she's such a fake. I mean, she's using her illness to get attention from boys. How pathetic. I couldn't believe it. Did they think I was deaf or something? They were the ones who were fake with their thick layers of makeup and all of their gossip and drama. I didn't really care that they were saying these things, but what really got to me was the way Miss Atkin laughed along with them. I actually saw her nod her head, so she agreed with them. I knew that wasn't okay, and Joe saw it too. He was so angry and grabbed my hand and said we had to report her to the principal. I stopped him though and said, just leave it. I am still the new girl here, and I don't want to cause any drama. And anyway, I have a plan. I smirked at him as I said this. So, Miss Atkin has this policy where if someone's phone rings in class, they have to answer it on speakerphone. And that policy includes her, too. So that day, I pretended to bump into her as she entered the class and watched as her phone dropped out of her hands. I quickly picked it up and apologized for being so clumsy, but at the same time, I unmuted it when she wasn't looking. Easy peasy. You see, I'd arranged for Joe to call her. This was going to be hilarious. Sure enough, five minutes later, her phone started ringing loudly. Her ringtone was Beyonce's single ladies, and everyone burst out laughing. She freaked out and quickly grabbed her phone to cancel it. But Joe was persistent. He just kept calling, and everyone in class reminded her of the policy, so she had no choice but to answer it. Well, just wait for this. She answered, and suddenly Joe's voice filled the room. But he'd put on a funny accent to make himself sound older. Honey, don't forget about our secret date at our favorite hotel tonight. Miss Atkin looked like she wanted to die. She said, who is this? I don't know you. Then Joe said, come on, baby, what's up? Is your husband there? Miss Atkin was now visibly shaking and said, you've got the wrong number. But Joe wouldn't stop. Ah, you're so cute. I'll see you tonight, baby. Get ready for a fun night, wink wink. At that, Miss Atkin hung up and the whole class was just deathly silent. I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from laughing. Joe had really outdone himself. 
However, I hadn't exactly thought it all through because a couple of days later, Joe and I were about to walk home when he got called into the principal's office. I went with him, but they wouldn't let me in. I could see Miss Atkin in the room along with the principal and Joe. She'd somehow found out that it was Joe who'd called her, and now the principal said that Joe would be expelled and that his parents would need to come in for a meeting the following day. Oh my god, this was all my fault. When he came out, I rushed over and started apologizing, but Joe said, Don't worry, I did it, so I'll take the responsibility. I was beside myself with guilt. I just kept saying, Joe, no, this is my fault. I'm the one who should be expelled. But Joe wouldn't even listen to me. Well, that evening, I told my parents the whole story. I was crying as I told them, and obviously they were angry, but they were also supportive. The next day, Joe's parents came for their meeting. The principal was there, and the school board, and of course, Miss Atkin. Luckily, my parents arrived just in time to interrupt the meeting, and we burst into the room. We told them the truth, how I'd been so ill and had to get a tutor, and that's why I carry that notebook. Then how Miss Atkin had treated me so badly and been so rude to me the whole time. I told them the phone call incident had been my fault and that Joe had just wanted to help me. Suddenly, Miss Atkins stood up and pointed at me and said, I knew it was you. You spoiled brat. You should be expelled. What happened next was crazy. My mom jumped up and said, How dare you speak to my daughter like that? You hate her because she's my daughter. Get over it, Angela. It's been years. Well, Miss Atkin ran towards my mom and said, You're a horrible woman. And so is your daughter. You deserve each other. She was about to grab my mom, but my dad jumped up and stopped her. I didn't understand what was happening. Everyone was so shocked. The principal looked so puzzled. Then he told us all to go home and calm down. When we got home, my mom sat me down and said, If you're being mistreated, you need to tell us. Don't suffer it out alone, okay? I told my mom I was fine and that school was great. But then my dad interrupted and said, You're fine? Don't lie to us. You were almost expelled. Then my mom said, Honey, calm down. It's not her fault. You saw her teacher. She's a demon. Then my dad just laughed and... I was so confused. Then he said, Oh yeah, Lori, we should have told you this already, but Miss Atkin was at school with us. Then they told me how the three of them had gone to high school together, and both my mom and Miss Atkin had a crush on my dad, so they became sworn enemies. They fought all the time, and Miss Atkin had been expelled from school because of my mom. Of course, my dad hadn't known all of that back then, and he'd fallen in love with my mom. Wow, now I understand the real reason Miss Atkin treated me like that. She was obviously still angry at my mom, and when she'd seen my name, she hadn't been able to control her anger anymore, and she'd just released it all on me. My mom said, Lori, you look exactly like me in high school. Because I was pretty, so many people were jealous. <laughs> Then she turned to my dad, smiled, and said, I can see that Joe is quite similar to your dad. You should be careful. At that, mom and I burst out laughing. My dad was just speechless. And guess what? It all worked out in the end. Miss Atkin got reassigned to another school, and Joe and I were only suspended from school for two weeks. Now we're closer than ever, and there's definitely some real chemistry between us. Finally, high school is getting good again, huh? In high school, there are always those mean girls, right? Well, turns out, I was actually the mean girl, and it took something really awful for me to realize it. You see, I'm a pretty average kind of girl. Average looking, average grades, and I guess you could say I'm a little chubby. Yeah, I'm that invisible. But thank God, I had some good friends, so it's okay. I'm content with my mediocre life, but one day, I received a note in my locker. There's even a heart on it. My heart started beating so fast. Could it be? I read on and couldn't believe it. It was from a guy called Dave, and he was confessing his feelings for me. He even left his phone number. I was stunned. And then I got to the bottom of the note, and reality hit me smack bang in the face. I'll be waiting for your call, Sarah. It wasn't for me. It was for Sarah. Of course it was for Sarah. All the boys fancied her. 
And who wouldn't? She was the prettiest girl in school. Plus, her locker was right next to mine, so he just made a mistake. I was about to pop it in her locker when I saw her walking towards me. I tried to hide my disappointment that the note hadn't been for me. It drove me crazy to see her bouncing towards me with her blonde, curly hair and gorgeous smile. When she saw me, she started making small talk and even complimented me on my cardigan. It was so weird. What's so good about that to talk about? Was that compliment a kind of sarcasm or something? This angelic girl always gave me uneasy feelings. I bet she's that type of mean girl that's just being nice to your face, then later comes home and puts your name in her burn book. After she walked away, I scrunched up the note and threw it in my bag. Later that night, I did something insane. I texted Dave, pretending to be Sarah. I don't know why I did it, but after a few texts back and forth, it actually became quite fun. I looked him up on social media, and I couldn't believe how handsome he was. He was a year older, and so his classes were in another building. No wonder I hadn't noticed him before. Even our cafeterias were in different buildings, so he'd probably never seen me either. Not that he would notice me anyway, though. I felt so wild messaging him. I'd never done anything like this before, and it actually felt quite fun to pretend to be Sarah. I could just talk to him so freely and didn't have to overthink if I was sounding like a loser. Because in those moments, I was Sarah, the most popular girl in school. And it felt amazing. It didn't matter what I said, because I knew that David thought I was Sarah. And so everything I said to him was funny or cute. I even told my best friend Clara what I was doing, and she was amazed that I had the courage to do such a thing. I showed her our texts, and she was like, Wow, girl. You are crazy. I continued to text him though, and eventually I found I couldn't stop. I didn't know how long I could keep it up before I got caught, but I figured I'd get bored before then anyway. But then one day, he asked me to meet him after school, and I froze. Obviously, I couldn't meet him, nor let him approach the real Sarah in real life. So I made up some excuse about how my parents were super strict, and I'd get in trouble if anyone saw us. But he insisted, saying he had a gift for me, so I told him to leave it on top of the vending machine for me instead. To my surprise, he thought this was a really romantic idea, and so he agreed. Throughout the next week, he left me a gift every day. One day, it was a small crystal in the shape of a rose. The next day, it was a book of poetry. That was sweet. I didn't expect such delicacy from a jock. And then he asked me to meet him at the basketball game that Friday. He sounded so serious. I guess his patience had run out. Well, of course, it would be too absurd to go to the same school, but didn't see each other at all for two weeks straight, right? I had no other choice but to agree. But then, the panic kicked in. It was the finale of a big tournament at school, so everyone was going. And Sarah will be there too. And if Dave saw her, no. It would just be a disaster. My life would be over if they knew what I'd been up to. I asked Clara what I should do, and she was like, What? You haven't ended that catfishing thing yet? You need to tell him now, before it's too late. She'd called me a catfish. I was so offended, so I just stormed off and said I'd make my own plan without her help. I knew exactly what I was going to do. When I got home, I raided my mom's medicine cabinet and found it her laxative syrup. I poured a little into a fruity drink I'd bought. Obviously, I'd followed the instructions and only poured a little. I mean, I didn't want to knock Sarah out. I just wanted to give her enough so she'd miss the game. Little did I know how badly this was all going to unfold. When I got to school the next day, I made sure I was early and put it on Sarah's desk. I heard footsteps though and almost jumped out of my skin. Luckily, it was just Clara. And when she asked me what I was up to, I just said I'd seen a boy dropping this off on Sarah's desk and had felt jealous, so I'd taken a look. Sarah later took it without hesitation, since receiving gifts from secret admirers wasn't new to her. Well, success. After P.E. later that day, Sarah drank it. But then, disaster struck. Her friends also wanted a sip, so she passed it around. And to my complete horror, Clara had a sip too. I wanted to jump in and stop them, but I couldn't. In the next class, everyone kept running to the bathroom. It was so awkward. Luckily, Clara only had one bathroom trip, 
and then she was fine. She thought she'd just eaten something bad. If only she knew the truth. Sarah must have drunk much more than the others, because she still looked pale after several trips. During break, I went over to her and asked if she was okay. Then I suggested she'd go home and rest, and even offered to help her walk to her car. At that point, I was actually more worried for her than for my plan, but, well, my plan did work anyway. Later that night, Dave texted me saying he couldn't find me at the basketball game. Well, me, meaning Sarah. I told him I wasn't feeling well, and so he said he'd send me a gift the next day to make me feel better. Well, that was the moment Clara came over and confronted me. She busted into my room saying, I know what you did. Isn't that too much? Then she said she'd seen the syrup in my backpack. I was stunned. But then I just told her that it was time those mean girls got a taste of their own medicine. But she was furious. She said, you're ridiculous. Sarah isn't a mean girl. She's so sweet. She's even nice to you. Are you that blinded by jealousy that you'd sink this low to hurt her? You know what? You're the only mean girl around here. At that, she stormed off, leaving me standing there all alone. I froze there, dumbfounded. What just happened? What did I just hear? Was I the mean girl? That couldn't be true, right? Was Clara even my friend? How could she say that to me? She kept calling me catfish, then mean girl. This girl was really too much. But her words kept lingering in my mind. I thought about it. Sarah really had never done me any harm. So why was I being so mean to her? It wasn't right of me. That night, I couldn't sleep. I felt so guilty. I'd really let things get out of control. Why was I even doing this? It's not like I even really liked Dave. Sure, it felt nice to have a cute guy talking to me, but he was only talking to me because he thought I was Sarah. I didn't know what I was trying to do anymore. The day after, Dave had left a new gift box on the vending machine. I kept looking at it and wasn't sure if I should take it. But then suddenly, a guy noticed it, took it down, and saw it was addressed to Sarah. Then he quickly ran to class and gave it to her. It all happened so quickly, I didn't even have time to react. I ran after him to see what would happen next. Sarah and her friends were all gathered around the box and kept saying, Dave? Isn't he your crush? That Dave Miller? Wow, girl, congrats! But why did he leave a gift for you? I could see Sarah was blushing, and that's when I realized she actually liked him. Oh my god, I'd messed everything up! She was so happy, which made me feel even worse. Clara was right. I was the mean girl, not Sarah. I had to act quick before Sarah found Dave and they both discovered the truth. I texted Dave and asked him to meet me at the park in secret. As soon as I arrived, I could see he was there already, excitedly waiting. I hid behind a tree from afar and called him, and then I asked him to let me explain first. I told him I wasn't Sarah, and then I'd been doing this because I was just tired of feeling like a loser. But I didn't expect I'd taken this all too far. I'm so sorry, I said to him. He was so confused and kind of angry at first. But then, after a while, he said that back in middle school, he'd been a bit of a nobody, so he could understand where I was coming from, but he needed time to process it all. When he was about to hang up, I said, wait, then ran towards him and said I was the girl on the phone and that I had good news for him, that the real Sarah actually did like him too, and that all he needed to do was go and get her. He looked unsure and said, you're not lying to me again, are you? Then I said, I swear. She's got the biggest crush on you. Please let me make up for this all. I'll help you. He looked so happy, and I felt better knowing I was helping this happy couple get together. They deserved each other. I even helped him choose out the next gift for Sarah. Yep, the actual Sarah this time. And ever since then, I kind of became his wingman. As for Clara, of course, I apologized to her and thanked her for being a good friend and for knocking some sense into me. And now, Sarah and Dave are officially a couple, and I even hang out with them sometimes. In fact, Dave's friend has been hitting on me, so let's see if anything happens there. Maybe I'll finally get a real boyfriend. Sarah, it's about time you got married. 
What are you talking about? Get married? Not a chance. I'm still in school. Oh, give me a break. Marrying a rich guy will bring you more money than school ever will. Mom, I'm not like you. I actually like school. Now leave me alone. That was the conversation between my mom and I about two months ago. Well, look at me now. Here I am staying in one of the most luxurious villas in Boston. My name's Sarah, by the way, and I'm 16 and in high school. My life hasn't ever been normal. For starters, I don't have a dad, and my mom is totally irresponsible, choosing to spend any money we have on partying and men. Of course, she doesn't even have a job, so we rely on her latest fling to help support us. <sighs> my mom has never really cared about me, so I just stay out of her life as well. She can do what she wants as long as I can do what I want. And what I want is to study really hard so that I can have a better life than hers. But as usual, she intervened in that plan, and two months ago she forced me to quit high school and get married. Obviously, I refused, and I even went on a hunger strike for a few days. But then one day she said, Tomorrow, our two families will meet. If you don't rock up, I'll go to your school and tell them you're not coming back. But if you come, you can still go to school. At least until the wedding. Ugh, school. She's using what I love most against me, again, to force me to follow all of her ridiculous plans. Fine, I agreed. I mean, it was just a meetup. It's not like they could pressure me to get married right away, right? So the next day, I followed my mom to go meet Adam's family. I was shocked when I saw him. He was wearing a mask that covered half of his face, and he just sat there, not uttering a word just staring at me without even blinking. Honestly, it was so creepy. His parents seemed nice, though, and they explained that he'd been in an accident when he was a kid, which had left him with a severe burn scar on his face. So he wore the mask to avoid scaring people off. I could see him watching me, waiting for my reaction. So I tried to smile back. I felt so bad for him. But at the same time, there was no way I wanted to spend my life with this guy. So I decided to put my plan into action. All I had to do was get his parents to disagree with the arrangement, so I acted as clumsy as possible. I wanted to give the worst first impression ever. As soon as the wine was poured, I leaned over and knocked his mom's glass all over her white dress. My mom looked mortified, but I didn't stop there. I ate with my hands and dropped food all over the table and kept chewing with my mouth wide open. But no matter how hard I tried, Adam's parents still seemed to like me, and I could see him slightly smirking at me. What did a girl have to do to put this family off? Clearly they were desperate. Near the end of the meal, they started discussing the engagement. Apparently, I'd move into Adam's family house so we could get to know each other. Then, if I could help Adam to feel less insecure, they'd let me finish high school before we had to get married. Um, so didn't that mean they just wanted a friend for Adam? Someone to keep him company? Hmm. It's not that bad. I guess I can do that then. So after the engagement, I moved into Adam's mansion. After school every day, I'd hang out with him and try to cheer him up. I'd play him my fave music, show him some epic movies, even try telling him jokes. But still, he barely smiled. He wasn't interested in anything I liked. Then one day I was struggling with my science homework when he passed by and decided to check out what I was doing. Suddenly he started chatting away and I realized how much he loved chemistry and physics. He even offered to help me with my assignments. He was so passionate about those subjects, and this was a win-win, because I'd finally found something we could discuss. He even started opening up to me. It was a start. I began to feel more comfortable around him. On one sunny day, I even asked Adam if he wanted to play a game of badminton. At first he refused, as he didn't like being outside, but I wouldn't stop begging until he said, Fine. Have you played this game before? No. Okay, then let me show you. I was so excited to teach Adam. Although I'm not great at hand-eye coordination, I'd been playing badminton a lot at school, so I felt pretty confident. Finally, I'd found something I was better at than him. Ha! Huh. Okay, so I spoke too soon. After a few missed serves, he somehow mastered the shuttlecock and kicked my ass. <sighs> Why did you say you've never played this before? Because it's the truth. I, I don't believe you. Adam just shrugged and then left me lying on the ground. He had to be bluffing. It's impossible for anyone to be that good the first time they do something. Ugh. But it was fun, I guess. 
Adam was growing on me, but I couldn't be around him 24-7 as I had classes to attend. And no cap, I was extremely happy that I still got to go to school. Plus, at school, something incredible happened. One day, I was walking through the schoolyard when I tripped over a can. Just as I was about to faceplant on the ground, a hand appeared and pulled me back up. We made eye contact, and I swear it was love at first sight. His name was Brian, and he's super handsome. From that moment on, we texted nonstop every day, and it wasn't long before he asked me to be his girlfriend. And of course I said yes. I was smitten, but I obviously had to hide it from Adam and his parents. One night, I was on the phone with Brian when suddenly a text from my mom arrived. In fact, ever since the engagement, she hadn't even been in touch. Maybe she was too busy spending the huge amount of money that Adam's parents had given her. Sarah, I really need some cash, just around $500. Can you please ask Adam if he can lend me it? What? How have you already spent the money his parents gave you? Stop asking questions, just get me that money, okay? Ugh, money, money, money. All she cared about was money. She didn't even ask if I was okay. Um, um, I, I want to ask. Can, can you get me some money? Money? For what? Um, I, I, I need to pay for my tutoring class. I haven't had money to pay for the past few months. Hmm, how much do you need? Um, about five hundred dollars. Okay, I'll tell the butler he'll give it to you later. Phew, that was easier than I thought. Uh, but Adam didn't ask twice about it. Was it because that amounts just nothing to a rich guy like him? Anyway, at least he'd said yes. That would shut my mom up for a bit. If only... A few days later, she texted me again. This time she wanted $3,000. Was she kidding me? Uh, I just ignored her. But she kept bombarding me with texts and calls. It went on for days. She wouldn't leave me alone. I didn't give in, though. Until this photo was sent to my phone. It was of me and Brian holding hands and clearly in love. Turns out my mom had been so desperate for the money, she'd turned up at my school one day to talk face to face. And that's when she saw us together. She then threatened me and said that if I didn't get her the money, she'd tell Adam's family what I was up to. This terrified me because then I'd have nowhere to go, and I wouldn't be able to go to school anymore. I couldn't let that happen. I had no other choice but to keep asking Adam for the money with my lame excuses. From buying books, to a relative who was ill and needed treatment, you name it, I'd use it. Every time I asked Adam, he looked at me like he was worried about me and asked if I was okay. This made me feel even more guilty, because it seemed like he genuinely cared about me. To make up for it, I'd bake him cookies, and even knit a cute sweater for him as a birthday gift. But then, a few weeks later, he asked if we could talk. As soon as I walked into his room, he threw a bunch of photos at me. They were all of me and Brian. I couldn't believe it. Did my mother betray me? But that's not the case. He told me how he'd had someone follow me because he felt I'd been acting weird. Not only had he discovered I was dating someone, he'd also found out that I'd been lying about the money and giving it to my mom. He was so disappointed in me. Please leave me alone. I don't want to see you anymore. I was so worried I'd be kicked out of their house, but no one mentioned anything. His parents still chatted to me at dinner, and they seemed happy enough. Only Adam avoided me, which of course made me feel terrible. The only one I had to lean on right now was my sweet Brian. So after dinner one night, I decided to go over to his place. I really needed some comfort right now. But when I arrived outside, through the window, I saw another girl in his room. They started kissing. And I thought I was going to be sick. In a panic, I quickly crawled over and hid below his window to listen in. But aren't you a bit too close with that Sarah girl lately? Don't you dare. Don't worry, pumpkin. It was all just for you. I noticed that she lives in a big mansion, with personal drivers and all. Her family must be filthy rich. So, I just wanted to be a good friend and help them spend those money. You know, and maybe that way, I could get you the new Chanel handbag that you always want. Oh, really, honey? So, how's it going? Well, a dud. Seems like she's the stingy kind of rich girl. Ugh, keeping every single nickel all to herself. 
How was I supposed to believe what I'd just heard? My heart was shattered into pieces, and I couldn't hold it in anymore. I stood up and put my face against the window. You're dumped! Brian looked so shocked to see me there, but I didn't wait to see if he had anything to say. I just ran home in tears and locked myself in my room. Sarah, open the door. Do you know how many days you haven't eaten for? Sarah, open the door. If not, I will send someone to break the door down. Oh, God, are, are you okay? What's going on? Nothing. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for lying to you all this time. I, I didn't mean to. Suddenly, Adam hugged me and said, It's okay. Don't cry. Now, can you just tell me what happened? In tears, I told Adam the whole story. From being used by my mother to being betrayed by Brian. Perhaps this is what I deserve for lying to you. Actually, if I were you, I wouldn't want to marry someone like me anyway. You're a great guy. As long as you have confidence in yourself and live with a more positive attitude, good things will happen to you, I promise. Even with this ugly face? I looked up at Adam and, oh my gosh, the burn scar on his face. It was worse than I thought it would be. I reached out to touch it. It must have been so painful. Can we, can, can we start over? Keep helping me, okay? I looked at Adam, smiled and nodded. So after that day, I continued to stay at Adam's house and help him get out of the isolated, self-deprecating life he'd been living. Gradually, his attitude improved, and he even started taking a business course to get ready for taking over his family's company in the future. I also encouraged him to start taking off his mask. Love everything about yourself, including that scar. As for my mom, she's currently being detained for her illegal gambling. Yep, that's what she spent all that money on. She'll probably end up in prison. And even though this isn't what I want for her, she kind of deserves it. Oh, and about the wedding. We postponed it. Lucky for me, both Adam and his parents want me to go to college first and pursue my dreams. Once I graduate, we'll probably start planning our wedding, though. And it'll be truly out of love this time. <laughs> My phone beeped with a new message. Emma, I've got something to do nearby, so let's meet there. See ya. It was from Tony, my childhood friend from the orphanage back in Missouri. Yep, that's right. I ended up in an orphanage after my mom passed away when I was only four years old. But things were even worse for Tony and him. They'd been left outside the orphanage door without anyone even knowing who their parents were. And now, here I am on my way to visit his grave, as today's his death anniversary. <sighs> Time flies. I can hardly believe it's been ten years already. I picked up some flowers, then drove to the cemetery. Tony was already there waiting for me. I smiled and waved, but my heart felt heavy. Back when we were fourteen, we'd been joined at the hip, Tony, Thomas, and me. I had a secret crush on Thomas, but I never got the chance to tell him. It had all happened so fast on that day. We were just kids, young and dumb. We'd snuck out to go play by the riverbank. One minute we were splashing each other in the river. The next moment, Thomas was being carried away in the current. I tried to save him, but Tony pulled me back to shore. Even thinking about it now, I still couldn't help but burst into tears. Don't cry, Em. I'll always be here for you. And I knew he would be. Deep down, I knew Tony always had feelings for me. But I didn't feel the same way. <sighs> After that, Tony drove me home. Seeing my exhausted look, he said before I went inside, Get a good night's sleep, Em. Remember, we've got that interview tomorrow. Gosh, I almost forgot. Tony probably thought I was the worst employee ever. <laughs> and yes, you can guess it. Tony is my boss. After years in the orphanage, he was adopted by a super smart family that had inspired him to strive to become someone important, and he'd eventually built a food startup. Anyway, the following morning, despite still feeling worn out, I had no choice but to put on a brave face to go to work, as I had a marketing team to lead. But as I walked into the lobby, 
a guy bumped into me. He helped me up and frantically apologized, explaining he was in a rush. I looked up and was about to nag him, but wait, why does he look so familiar? In fact, he looked exactly like... It's you! You... I stammered, but I couldn't even finish my sentences because he'd rushed into the lift and the doors had closed. I must have been seeing things. Honestly, throughout the whole interview, I could barely concentrate. Could there be two people looking that similar on this earth? I was lost in thought when the next applicant came in, and it was him! Both Tony and I stared in shock. He was the spinning image of Thomas. But it couldn't be. I mean, Thomas had died years ago. We both were too stunned to say anything until his voice broke the silence. Hi, I'm Dustin, and I'm here to interview for the marketing position. I looked at Tony, and he looked just as confused as I did. But, yeah, it wasn't Thomas. This guy was from Illinois and had never even been to Missouri. Okay, so here's Thomas's doppelganger. Fair enough. The interview went well, and even though he was a bit arrogant, he knew what he was doing, so we hired him. When I left the room, surprisingly, Dustin was still waiting for me outside. He offered to treat me to lunch as an apology for earlier. I agreed, as I was desperate to ask him more questions. During lunch, I kept mentioning the orphanage, some of Thomas's hobbies and things he hated, but Dustin didn't even bat an eyelid. I was disappointed, because I really hoped Dustin would actually be Thomas. That night, I barely slept. I couldn't stop thinking about Dustin. It's ridiculous, but I still had a strong feeling that he really was my childhood sweetheart. Suddenly, I got a message from Tony. Saw you hanging out with Dustin. Wake up, Em. He's not Thomas. Ugh. I didn't need to hear that. The next day, I couldn't take my eyes off of Dustin. At lunch, I watched as he put honey on his watermelon, and I almost freaked out. That was exactly what Thomas used to do. Oh my, I blurted out. I then told Tony what I just saw as soon as he sat down, but he just laughed and said, Honestly, um, tons of people do that. Do you really think that our Thomas could be that arrogant? Seeing that I was still unfazed, he continued, But if you still want to check, just give him a peach. Things can change, but allergies don't, right? OMG, Tony was a genius. He probably was just kidding, but I was super serious. So the next day, I bought Dustin a peach pie to welcome him to the team. But to my surprise, he ate it up with pleasure and seemed totally fine. Okay, clearly I needed to let this go. He wasn't Thomas, end of. But if only things were that simple... And even though I knew Dustin wasn't Thomas, I still felt attracted to him. He was smart and sweet, and so much fun to be around. Eventually, we started hanging out and became very close. We didn't actually make anything official, but we were low-key dating already. However, it was impossible to hide things from Tony. One time, our company went on a team bonding weekend, and we'd arranged a tennis competition. We had to pair up, so obviously I would go with Dustin, but as we're about to go sign up, then Tony came to ask me to be his partner too. My god, it was so awkward. Then Tony said in a very sulky tone, Okay, how about we have a little competition? The winner gets to pair up with Emma. And so they had a swimming race. That's so embarrassing. I knew Dustin couldn't swim, so I started to panic but he got in the pool anyway. Obviously, Tony won, but who cares? He was acting like a child. I rushed over to help Dustin, who was left coughing and choking on the water, and at that moment, I realized that I was falling for him so much. But since then, there were rumors in the company that Dustin was only flirting with me to get promoted. One morning, we were walking through the lobby together when two girls started whispering about us. So Dustin took my hand and went straight to the girls, saying, I love Emma. What's wrong with that? Hmm, tell me. Go on. At that exact moment, Tony appeared and asked if he could have a word with Dustin in his office. I was so nervous. 
Now everyone knew we were in some weird triangle, and I didn't like it one bit. Then one of my colleagues overheard Tony telling Dustin that if he didn't leave me alone, he'd be fired. I couldn't believe it. I went to find Tony right away, and before I could even confront him, he said, Yes, it's true. I asked those girls to start the rumors, and I also asked that jerk to give up on you. It was me. I did it all. I just don't get it, Em. Why have I ever been good enough for you? Tony, wait. It's been ten years. Why couldn't you give me a chance? Why can't you let Thomas go? Some guy who looks like him walks up and you totally forget about me? He's a loser compared to Thomas. Don't you dare call him a loser, I said. See? In the end, you still care about him only. Not me. Tony shouted and stormed off. I hated to be in this situation. On the one hand, I truly liked Dustin, but Tony was not only my lifesaver, but also my best friend, who'd stuck by my side through all the highs and lows. What a dilemma. In the end, I decided to have a little space from Dustin, just until things cooled down. Maybe then, the rumors would stop, and people would quit being so negative about him. But that wasn't to be so. You see, our new product that hadn't even been released yet suddenly appeared on the website of our direct competitor. Someone must have leaked the confidential file. But who? An investigation was opened and all of our computers were checked. You won't believe it, but the IT team had been able to recover a deleted email that had been sent to our rivals from Dustin's outbox. Dustin denied it and he demanded to check the CCTV. That's how we caught Mike, one of our senior employees, at Dustin's computer sneakily doing something. And to think, he'd put the blame on Dustin. After the truth came out, I went over to Dustin, but he seemed mad as he said, You think I'm a jerk too, don't you? That's why you've been giving me the cold shoulder. I told him I never believed he'd done it. Then I took his hand. I'm so sorry. It's just that I've been through some stuff. Then we hugged. Oh my, I missed him so much. But the drama didn't end there. The info leaked had caused our company huge losses. We had thousands of meetings, and the stress was unreal. Feeling so deflated, I went up to the rooftop to get some air. Suddenly, I heard Dustin's voice somewhere. He was on the phone with someone, talking about some plan to steal our company's products. No way! Without even thinking, I charged over and snatched his phone away to see that he was talking to... Mike? Oh. My. God. Had they been accomplices from the beginning? I was so angry, but actually more disappointed. So I asked him to resign and stay away from my sight. I know I should have exposed him to the whole company instead of letting him go that easy, but I guess my heart couldn't bear to do that. <sighs> I felt so bad, especially towards Tony, the best friend who's always by my side, while I was busy chasing after a jerk. I lost contact with Dustin after that, and I barely had time to think about it because our company was on the brink of bankruptcy. But one day, I got a call from him, followed by a message saying, Please don't ignore me. I've got something important to tell you. So we met up the next day at a coffee shop, and as soon as I saw him, I said, Look, Dustin, I've had enough of your lies. Please just get to the point. Then he replied, Emma, I admit that I only came to work for your company to steal your ideas. But seeing you and Tony after all these years, and falling for you all over again, well, that wasn't part of my plan. I was confused. After all these years? What are you talking about? Then he showed me his wrist, and he was wearing a friendship bracelet. Remember this? You gave it to me on my birthday ten years ago. O-M-G. What was going on? I couldn't believe my eyes. I'd given this to Thomas. But then why? But the peach, I continued. He just laughed and said, I overheard you guys' plan, so I made sure to take allergy meds just before. Then he went on to explain that he was Thomas and that he'd been lucky enough to be saved that day on the river. There was a family who were out in the river searching for their drowned son, but instead of finding him, they found Thomas, 
and so they kindly adopted him and changed his name to their sons, Dustin. This was insane. Here was Thomas right in front of me after all these years. And guess what? His adoptive father is the director of our rival company. And so he'd asked Dustin, or should I say Thomas, to come and infiltrate our company. Thomas kept apologizing for it, saying how much it had tormented him and that he just missed me and had to tell me the truth. My head was spinning. This was all too much. I needed a moment to think it all through. But in the end, we decided that he could help our company by uploading a post to expose the truth. Obviously, as soon as Tony heard about it all, he was furious. He was mostly mad at me because I'd covered for Thomas. He'd even stopped talking to me for a while. But putting that aside, after Thomas's post, things got better for our company. We were able to launch new products as scheduled, and he even contributed some capital to help with our new project. Now our companies are still rivals, but at least it's now a fair competition. As for Tony and I, we eventually made up. He came to find me one day after work and said, Um, I'm so sorry for how childish I've been. I was just jealous of you and Thomas. I was too selfish to consider your feelings. But you and Thomas, I want you guys to be together. You two are made for each other. I couldn't stop crying as he said that. It meant so much to me. And guess what? It has now been a whole year since Thomas came back into our lives. And the three of us are back to being the best of friends. Oh, and I should probably add that Thomas and I are engaged. We're so happy, and we're even opening an orphanage together for homeless kids like us. I'm going through many phases, but I finally found peace in life. I guess it all worked out after all. Everyone talks about how Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, full of love and cheer and surprises. Well, last Christmas, our family got the biggest surprise of all. I'm Grace, and Christmas has always been my favorite holiday. That was until one year when everything changed. At the time, I was only 10, and my little sister was 3. It was Christmas Eve, and we were all so excited as it had snowed. That meant we were going to have a white Christmas. But suddenly, I heard loud voices. Our parents were fighting. I didn't know it at the time, but my dad had been having an affair, and my mom had just found out. I came downstairs just in time to see my dad slamming the door and driving away. Mom was in tears and told me to run back upstairs and pack a bag for me and my sister. Then we drove to my aunt's house, and the three of us stayed there that night. We woke up on Christmas morning, and because Mom is a nurse, she had to go to work as she was on duty that day. We opened our presents, and then me and my sister went outside to play in the snow. Suddenly, our dad appeared, and we were so happy to see him. He had presents, and he asked us to quickly jump in the car with him so we could go home to see what Santa had brought us. I remember he smelled kind of funny, and I thought he must have forgotten to bathe. But it was the smell of alcohol. He'd been drinking all night and was completely over the limit. As we drove away, our aunt came running out, but it was too late. We were on our way home. It happened so quickly I barely remember it. We must have crashed because the next moment the car was skidding to the side of the road and me and my sister were screaming. Dad had been so drunk he ended up crashing into two cars and injuring four people. Luckily, me and my sister were okay but dad wasn't. He ended up going to prison, and he wasn't allowed to see us anymore. My mom went crazy when she found out, and she wouldn't even let us see him in prison. We were too young to really understand, but we just knew we weren't going to see our dad again. A couple of years ago, I asked mom about him, and she said he'd gotten out of prison and moved across the country, and that she didn't want to talk about it, so I never mentioned him again. And then my mom met a new guy named Neil, and I guess I like him, but I miss my dad a lot. Then Christmas came around, and it brought back all those memories. Mom always acted a little emotional on the day, and last year was no different. It hadn't snowed since that Christmas, but when we woke up on Christmas morning, my little sister came bouncing into my room to tell me it had snowed. We raced downstairs and started to put on our coats and our shoes. 
Even though I was 15, I couldn't resist a good old snowball fight. Afterwards, we opened our gifts, and Mom was really quiet. The snow obviously reminded her of what happened that Christmas with Dad. We spent the rest of the day watching movies and playing with our gifts, and then we sat down to enjoy dinner. We'd almost finished eating when the doorbell rang. My little sister went to open it. Who is it? I asked her, expecting it to be our aunt or something. But you won't believe who was standing there. It was Santa. Okay, so I know he's not real, but my little sister freaked out. Mom, Santa's here, she screamed. Mom came running towards the door with her boyfriend running behind her. We were all so confused. He had a bag of gifts and just stood there not saying anything. My sister was so excited, and she led him through to the lounge and offered him a glass of milk and some cookies. I just looked at Mom and shrugged my shoulders. He sat down and opened his bag. Then he handed me and my sister a gift. Mom kept saying there's no need for gifts, and I could hear Neil whispering to her, Who is this guy? But my little sister had already unwrapped it and was squealing with joy. He'd got her the exact video game console she wanted. Mom was shocked. And then I opened mine, and it was the latest iPhone. Whoa, thank you so much, I said. I could barely believe it. Sorry, who are you? My mom finally asked, but he didn't reply. He just started whistling jingle bells and looked kind of awkward. And then Neil said thank you to him and asked him to leave. Suddenly, he got up and just ran out. My sister tried to run after him, but he was too quick. Seriously, who was he? The rest of the evening was a little strange, and we were all so confused. My mom thought maybe my aunt had planned this and decided to ask her later when she came over. Neil went to pick her up, and as soon as he drove off, the doorbell rang. It was Santa, again. He said, Sorry, I forgot I had one last gift in my bag. And then he handed it to my mom. As soon as we heard his voice, we realized who it was. Daddy? I said. He took off his Santa hat and fake beard and just broke down. And suddenly we were all crying. Up until that moment, I don't think I'd realized just how much I missed him. Me and my sister ran into his arms, and Mom stood there silently sobbing behind us. She opened the gift, and then she started crying even more. It was a photo album of all of our memories together, up until that Christmas when everything went wrong. My girls, I'm so sorry. Please, please forgive me. I can't live another day without you all in my life. That Christmas ended up being the best Christmas of our lives. Our dad was back. We invited him to join us for dessert, and when Neil came back and found out who it was, he was furious, and so was my aunt. But me and my sister couldn't stop smiling. As for my mom, well, I think she was more shocked than anything, but it ended up being a magical day. Of course, my mom's boyfriend stormed off, but we were too distracted to really notice. Now we don't know what to do. Dad keeps contacting us and turning up at the door. I really want him back in our life, and it seems like Mom's falling back in love with him. She talks about him all the time, and every time he appears, she can't stop smiling. I mean, people change, right? Should we give him another chance? Hey, my name's Polly. I wasn't that bothered about boys or dating. I used to watch my friends swoon over boys and find it odd. Then, this all changed when I met Adrian. He was a senior at high school and a year older than me. He was smart, sporty, funny, and easygoing, and I found him so charming and attractive. Sadly, his parents passed away when he was a kid, and now he lived with his uncle's family. As I knew, his life there was not easy. Needless to say, all the girls went crazy for Adrian, but he didn't like them. He liked me. When he asked me out for a date, I literally had to bite down on my gums to stop myself from squealing out in delight. At first, things were great. We were one of those sickeningly sweet couples that were stuck in our own love bubble. 
He gave me a lift to school, played with my hair as I tried to sort out my books and my locker out, and walked me to class and kissed me on the cheek before he said, Miss you millions, Pauls. I didn't have any previous relationships to compare Adrian to, so I presumed this was normal. Everyone liked Adrian. My friends thought he was the coolest guy ever and were quite happy to have him hang out with us all the time. I introduced Adrian to my parents and they instantly gelled to him. He was so good at the time and compliments and saying the right thing at the right time. After he left, mom wouldn't stop going on about how he was such a charming boy and dad told me to bring him around tomorrow as he wanted to show him his vintage toy car collection. As pleased as I was that my parents liked Adrian, it was also kind of annoying. They never spoke about me like they did Adrian. It was like they thought he was the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and I was just a lump of coal. Damn, I know. I was envious of the fact my parents liked my boyfriend. I mean, hello. Surely if they hated him, it would have been way worse. So I invited Adrian around after school. As our relationship continued, his bond with my parents grew. Adrian told my parents about all the inconveniences he had to suffer when he lived with his uncle's family and that he was trying so hard to move out as soon as he clocked 18 years old and gained independence. My parents felt so sorry for him and told him to come over whenever he wanted. I thought it was just a polite thing to say in that kind of situation, but then he actually stayed at my house far more than he stayed at his. You may be thinking that it's just great because me and him could spend more time with each other, but no. Most of the time, he was around my parents instead of me. And certain things did happen that made me feel uncomfortable, such as the time my parents made me go to bed early so they could watch a horror film with Adrian, as I'm a wuss and hate scary films. Another time I slept in and when I went downstairs the house was empty and there was a note on the kitchen table saying they'd all gone out to the zoo. Like, hello, I love the zoo. Why hadn't they asked me? Worse still, they came back later and wouldn't stop going on about their amazing day. I mentioned how this had upset me to Adrian later and he stroked my hair and told me that he thought I wouldn't want to go. Then he handed me a silver necklace kissed my hand and told me that I was his perfect princess. I was so smitten by him that I shoved all my worries to the back of my head and carried on like normal. One Saturday morning, I walked into the kitchen to find Adrian making pancakes with my mom. Okay, so I guess this wasn't so weird, but then he turned to my dad, who was reading his morning paper and asked, Dad, do you want blueberries on your pancakes? At first, I thought I misheard him, but then dad replied, Yes, son, that'd be grand. I coughed to make my presence known, then sat at the table. Dad just muttered morning to me above his paper, and mom gave me a half-hearted smile. Mom instructed that Adrian sit down. Then she served him up the biggest pile of pancakes ever. I got a couple of burnt ones. As mom took Adrian's plate, she ruffled his hair and said, Would you like any more? No thanks, Mom. I'm stuffed. He smiled at her. I scraped my chair back and stormed off. This was way too weird. They were my parents, not his. Things grew weirder between Adrian and my parents. They were always going to shops, restaurants, cinema, and places without me. Well, I might be practicing bass guitar with my band for an event of our school, but they could just arrange the time for me to join as usual, right? But since the day he walked into our lives, they had spent me almost no space and time. On many occasions, when I walked into the room, they all fell silent and acted as if they were hiding something from me. It was just so awkward. I felt like a stranger in my own home, and it was completely uncomfortable. Then, one day, I came home from school early as I had a headache to find Adrian packing bags into my parents' car. It turns out that they were going on vacation without me. Adrian suggested my parents take a wedding anniversary trip, and he told them that I would be performing on stage on that day, so they ended up preparing to go without even telling me a word. I totally freaked out. It was like I was finally seeing Adrian for who he truly was, a manipulative rat. Was he trying to steal my parents or what? 
I told him it was over and demanded that he leave me and my family alone right now. I expected my parents to take my side, only they didn't. They told me how I was behaving made them ashamed of me and that when they returned from their vacation and if I still held that such a selfish grudge, I'd better have left the house. Now, it's a month later and I'm staying at my friend Jenny's house. She's the only friend that's finally figured out what Adrian's really like. All the rest have been too manipulated by him. My parents still aren't talking to me and Adrian's still living in my house. My aunt told me that my parents helped Adrian decorate his own room, which was actually my room. And he'd been introduced to all my cousins and relatives as their son. I loved Adrian and I believed he loved me too. But now I know that it was all a lie. He manipulated me to worm his way into my life and steal it. I don't know what to do. I just want my life back. But how do I make my parents see Adrian for the true fraud he is? I'd just climbed back into the room when suddenly I heard a voice. Jasmine, how come you're only getting home now? I turned around to find Emma standing there. That's my business. Don't come home late like this again, okay? You'll be grounded if your dad finds out. I shrugged and closed my door without saying anything. Yep, that's Emma, my stepmom. She doesn't actually care. She just pretends to. If it wasn't for her telling my dad to forbid me from singing, then I wouldn't have to sneak out to go practice like this. Different day, same story. Yet again, I've had to lie about going to my singing practice. Honestly, I can't wait to be an adult so I can do whatever I want. Dad, I'm going over to Mix to study, I said as I headed for the door. Suddenly, Emma pulled me back and handed me a bottle. Huh? Licorice tea? Drink this after practicing. It helps keep your voice clear. Then she winked at me. Huh? So she knew I'd lied about where I was going, yet still she'd helped me? Maybe, just maybe, I've been misunderstanding her this whole time? Later that night, Emma suggested we should go for a picnic on the weekend, and for once, I excitedly agreed. But when the weekend rolled around, there was this hectic snowstorm. Ugh. Emma kept looking out at the snow, with disappointment written across her face. Ugh. That's when the idea hit me. How about we have an indoor picnic? Yes, that's right. That's a great idea. And so, we set up the tent right in our living room, and we were having the best time, when suddenly, the doorbell rang. I got up to answer it, and standing there, covered in snow, was a woman. She suddenly ran at me and said, Oh my gosh, Jasmine, you've grown up so fast. I've missed you so much. Before I could understand what was going on, Dad shouted, Megan, I can't believe you have the nerve to show up here like this. I know you won't accept my apology, but you don't understand. I had to see her. I've missed her every single day. Oh my God. So that woman was my mother? I couldn't hold back my tears and ran straight over to hug her. I swear I had been waiting for this moment for years. Mom gently stroked my hair and then turned to my dad. Can I stay here for a while? Just to make it up to my beloved daughter after such a long time being apart, Elvis? Are you joking? Get out of my house. Dad, please let her stay. Please. But no matter how much I begged, Dad wouldn't give in. And so I turned to Emma for help. Elvis, just let her stay here. If Jasmine wants to be with her mom this badly, we should let them have some time together. Come on, darling. I looked at Emma with so much appreciation, then turned those puppy eyes towards my dad. And eventually, he reluctantly nodded his head. Yay! I shouted and led mom to my room. From that day onwards, I spent most of my free time with her. We went to the movies together, shopping together, and honestly, it was the happiest I'd ever felt. One day, I was listening and humming along to my music when mom came in. Wow, so you also love singing? It must be genetic. Back then, if I hadn't been so passionately obsessed with music, which drove your dad crazy, I might never have left you like that. Now, I regret it. So much, Jasmine. 
I put my arms around her and softly said, After all these years, I still think about that lullaby. Can you sing it to me? Which one? I sang you many lullabies back then. It's Don't Know Why by Nora Jones. Oh, right. That one. Then she started singing. I swear to God, her voice was like an angel. But strangely, it didn't give me any of the feelings I had as a kid. Was it because I have grown up? While I was absorbed in my thoughts, I suddenly saw Emma's shadow at my doorway. But when she met my eyes, she hurried down the stairs. Huh? Why was Emma crying? I was so confused. She must be jealous of our relationship, Mom said. Yeah, probably, since she'd been married to my dad for three years, but we'd never been close. That evening, when I went to the kitchen with Mom to set the table, she suddenly shouted, Oh my gosh! Why did Emma make chicken parmigiana? Doesn't she know that your dad hates this? Then she took the plate and threw it in the trash, saying she would order takeaway instead. Huh? Dad hates this? He always complimented Emma on her signature dish. Before I could react, Emma entered the room. As soon as she saw her chicken in the trash, she glared at Mom. Things then got so awkward. Emma had skipped dinner. Mom also tried to start a conversation with Dad a few times, but he ignored her. Ugh, I felt so bad for Mom. In my dad's eyes, there was only Emma now. But my mother had done nothing wrong. She just wanted to pursue her passion. Later that night, I was heading to the pantry to get some snacks when I heard Emma yelling at Mom. Megan, for old time's sake, I didn't bring up anything from the past, but you can't just do whatever you want. How dare Emma yell at my mom like that? As soon as Emma left, I ran over to my mom asking her what had happened. She hesitated for a while, then told me the whole story. It turned out Mom and Emma used to be in the same band when they were young, and since Mom was always the lead singer, Emma had begrudged her ever since. Perhaps she has never gotten over it. Ugh, I didn't expect Emma to be so mean. So from that day on, I began to show my attitude towards Emma. I didn't let her go to the parent-teacher conference like I had promised before, and I even forbade Mick, my best friend, from talking to her every time he came over. Mom, how did you and Dad meet back in the day? Well, back then, your dad was a waiter at the lounge I used to sing at every weekend. We quickly fell in love and started leaving love letters for each other at our secret spot. Ew, how cheesy. It's called romantic, you silly. At that time, we put our initials at the end of every letter. Suddenly, there was some noise at the door, and I turned to see Dad standing right behind us. What do you mean, our initials? It represented our two favorite characters' names from that movie. Yes, it was the initials of Monica and Quincy in the movie Love and Basketball. Dad gaped at Emma in surprise as she continued. I was the one writing letters to you that year. But when I got to the meeting spot, I saw you and Megan together. So I left. Dad and Emma looked at each other, then turned to stare at Mom. Actually, back then I liked you so much that I pretended to be Emma. But it's not that important. In the end, you were still into me and we got along really well, right? I can't believe you lied to me like this for all these years. Then Dad angrily left the room, followed by Emma. As for Mom, she was sitting there, tears pouring from her eyes. Okay, so Mom was definitely in the wrong. But did Dad need to treat her like that? Who doesn't make mistakes from time to time? And anyway, it's because of my mom's mistake that I'm even here, right? From that day onwards, the atmosphere in the house was so intense. Dad ignored Mom, and Emma always gave Mom hateful looks. Until one day... I'd just gotten home from school when I saw my dad excitedly running towards me saying, Emma is pregnant. You're going to have a little brother or sister. Wow. I'd always wanted to have a sibling. I couldn't believe it. So that night, my family threw a party to celebrate, and Mom also congratulated Dad and Emma. And thanks to that, the tension between the three of them started to ease. Phew. But a few days later, for some reason, Dad found out that I'd lied about going studying with Mick. He was furious and grounded me for a week. I was sullenly playing on my iPad when Mom entered the room. Emma must be the snitch. Now that she's pregnant, she wants Dad to be angry with you, so he'll give all his love to her and the baby. Well, that just made sense. The other day, I'd even seen Emma whispering something to Dad, and as soon as he heard it, he got mad. Ugh, such a two-faced woman. 
I had to sort this out. And so I set up a fun plan for my stepmom. One time I made her orange juice using powdered cheese and she ended up spitting it out all over dad. <laughs> then I unscrewed the shower head to add blue food coloring. And that's how I gave her a Smurf makeover. It was hilarious hearing her horrid scream from the bathroom. Another time I snuck into Emma's room, trying to put flour in her hair dryer. I was rummaging through the bedside table looking for her hair dryer when suddenly I saw a DVD labeled Jasmine 0311. Huh? What's this? Why was my name on it? Curious, I went back to my room to play it. And then I couldn't believe my eyes. On the screen, Emma was carrying a baby and singing a lullaby to her. This melody. Wasn't it the song Don't Know Why? So that baby was me? But Emma couldn't sing. Could she? Her voice was weak and sounded hoarse. What did this mean? I rushed to show my dad the DVD. Emma told me not to talk about this, but since you already know, I won't hide it anymore. Then he told me everything. Turns out my mom left for a rich man when I was only two years old, and it was Emma who came and helped my dad take care of me during my younger years. Oh my gosh. What? So all those memories of my mom's warm hugs and lullabies were all actually of Emma? A feeling of guilt welled up in my heart. I had to do something to apologize to Emma. So the next day, I asked Mick to go to the mall to help me buy her a gift. As I was passing a coffee shop, I suddenly saw my mom sitting with some guy. Without thinking much, I quickly pulled Mick to a nearby table and eavesdropped on them. Honey, how's the money? You know how pushy the creditors are, and they're getting kinda aggressive. Don't worry, it won't be long now. My daughter's on my side. She'll help me kick her stupid stepmom out. Then my ex-husband will soon follow her wish and volunteer to give me money. What? What was going on? Had mom come back just for dad's money? I was about to go confront her when my phone rang. It was dad. Jasmine, go to the hospital right away. Emma is in the emergency room. By the time I got there, I saw my dad sitting outside the ER with his head in his hands. After a while, the doctor came out and said, Both mother and baby are okay. Next time, please pay more attention to the patient's food allergy. How could you eat stuff you're allergic to? You must be more careful, okay? Yeah, Emma always took good care. It didn't make sense. Unless... my mom... I was about to tell Dad about what I'd seen at the mall when Mom suddenly appeared, eagerly asking about Emma's situation. Unable to stand her pretense any longer, I shouted, Mom, drop the act. It was you who did all of this, wasn't it? Jasmine, what nonsense are you uttering? Furious, I immediately told them the whole story I've heard. Megan, I could forgive you for the old letter story and for trying to sabotage my voice, but the fact that you wanted to harm my baby is unforgivable. It turns out the stuff from the past that she mentioned before was that my mom harmed her to destroy her voice. So that's why dad didn't let me sing, for fear that it would cause Emma pain. Suddenly, Mom burst out laughing. <laughs> I don't need your pity. You were so lucky to have such a beautiful voice and a wonderful man by your side. And even now, you're still trying to take the life that should have been mine. Megan, give it up already. You need to stop this. Mom was about to say something, but I interrupted her. Mom, please just go. I'm so ashamed to have a mother like you. Then I burst into tears. She got up and left without even so much as a glance back at us. Emma took me into her arms. I was afraid that you would be disappointed. That's why I hid everything from you. I'm sorry for treating you so badly. She gently patted my head, and I felt like I was back in my childhood, where she'd held me and sang lullabies. It was so comforting. Finally, peace has returned to my family. I'm so fortunate to have Emma as a stepmom. And pretty soon... My little bro or sis will be here, and I can't wait. I'm standing in the middle of the room, wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, 
It's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi. I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey. Not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future. Blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates. Not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball. On one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with. Especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present. Right when the host announces that it's time for... My first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner, when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly, a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy. Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background, so from now on we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh. So he's from our school? Wow. 
just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name, though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time he even secretly slid a black pink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the masked knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh... My head is killing me! Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on... Those eyes... He must be... Thank goodness you're awake! Are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him, but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this... Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mom's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again. So I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone. And I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude. But wait, it was 9 p.m. already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke, and the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jer's. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now! <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Cause I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said. Did that mean 
he's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Cher lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head, then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to... Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived, Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase, give us back the business and what's rightfully ours, then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed, like father like sons. Very smart, but still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor. Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when... The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was... Mom! Stop right there. How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mom with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked knight. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting.
Wow, this Florida beach resort was the epitome of luxury. Hi, I'm Dakota, the beloved and only daughter of Hardy Bomber, the world-renowned wine billionaire. <sighs> but I don't know why. We have this huge fortune and dad still makes me study and always rushes me to get a job. Well, no way that's gonna happen. So for now, let's just enjoy this gorgeous place and this finest wine, shall we? FYI, there isn't a wine brand in the world I haven't tasted. I can distinguish them all easily with just one sip. Chardonnay versus Riesling? <laughs> Piece of cake. Hmm, let's see if there's anything interesting going on in the world. Wait, wh what is this? There must be some mistake. How, how can daddy be bankrupt? I called him repeatedly, but all I got was the busy signal. Something's wrong. I rushed to the private helicopter to return to our mansion. What's happening? Why are those men carrying away our valuable furniture? The nanny Maria ran out to me in tears. She told me daddy had disappeared and all he'd left behind was this wooden box. I rummaged through it but only found some old notebooks and a certificate of ownership for a farm winery. Oh well, dad may be bankrupt but at least I still have this vineyard to live off. Let's go check out my newly acquired assets then. This place looks huge. I wonder how much money it made a month. I looked around and then wandered into an enormous wine cellar. Curious, I touched some wine barrels when suddenly someone's voice snapped at me. Stay away from them. Who are you? <laughs> I'll have you know that I own this place, so I'll do whatever I want. Have you lost your mind? Get out, now! He suddenly grabbed my wrist and dragged me outside. I furiously screamed and people started to gather around. Listen up, my name is Dakota, Hardy Bomber's daughter, and from now on, I'm in charge around here. I show them the certificate of ownership as proof, but they didn't seem to care. Only an old looking man came to shake my hand. Welcome, Miss Bomber. I'm Jack, your father's long-standing companion. Come inside. My son James will show you around in a bit. Okay, finally! Someone showed some manners. Oh, I miss hanging out with my friends. I should have been at Fashion Week right now, not here in this lousy farm. Get up, couch potato. We have a vineyard to visit. Ugh, it's that rude guy again. It's too hot outside now. No way I'm making my way out there. So I shoot him away and continued staring at my phone. James then threw the stupid map of the winery at me and left. Thank God, he finally left me alone. After a week of lounging around and being waited on by Nanny Maria, I eventually longed for fresh air. Remembering the map James gave me, I decided to check out the place. First stop, the vineyard. Wow, it's so big! But why did they leave the soil so crackling dry? Let's see, where's the sprinkler? Ha! Huh, there we go. But as soon as I turn it on, a scowling farmer ran over and immediately turned it off. Hey miss, this is not your toy. What's the attitude? They're my employees but have the cheek to act this snootily to me? Harvest this in two weeks. To keep the sweetness of the grapes, no one waters them. Why is this James guy everywhere? I'm the daughter of the wine billionaire. I didn't need any preaching on how to run my farm. Days after that, I came to the farm to pluck up the grass, trim, and fertilize the plants. But I kept getting shooed out. Those awful farmers were so disrespectful. Fine, I needed to show them who's the real boss here. That night, I asked Jack to gather everyone in the communal dining room and declared I would fire some of them for their disrespectful attitudes. But they just gave indifferent looks. How dare they? Didn't they know I could just sell this place and make them all homeless? But then Jack handed me a contract signed by my daddy, stating that due to the blood, sweat, and tears they'd all put into this place, no one has the right to fire them or sell the farm. Jack also gave me other documents. Seemed like due to my family's bankruptcy, the farm had not been doing well. If nothing changes, it might be dissolved. What? So the only property dad left me was also on the verge of failing? I yelled at them. Then do something to sort it out, now! Suddenly, everyone got up from their seats and glared at me with anger. My head was spinning around. Feeling panicked, I rushed outside. I sat by myself, hugging the wooden box daddy left me in bewilderment. I flipped the notebooks and was surprised to find a letter in the bottom of the box, in which dad told all about how from the day mom passed away, He'd put all the effort into this farm and became a successful entrepreneur. I used to believe that compensating my time for work to provide you with a wealthy life would be enough. All this actually did was create a greater distance between us. 
My darling Dakota, I'm so sorry. My only hope is that you'll see as much beauty in this vineyard as I do. If only Dad was here now, how can I deal with all these troubles and challenges ahead? I burst into tears. They meant no harm. James' voice startled me. I quickly wiped away my tears. He sat beside me and offered a wine-spludged handkerchief. This isn't just some random form for these people. It's also their home. Don't accuse them of not trying. This form means far more to them than it does to you. I... I was just... This is when we should all stand together. Don't let your selfishness threaten the future of this whole winery and everyone involved. Even though I hated his guts, what he said did make sense. Maybe I had been neglectful of my responsibility for this place. If this winery was the most precious thing to my dad, then I want to put it right for him. James smiled gently, putting his hand on my shoulder. That's settled then. We're all gonna revive this place. He then left after telling me to show up at the cellar at 5 a.m. the day after. The next morning, while walking around, James told me everything about temperature control and wine brewing. Growing up, Dad would always pass on this wine knowledge to me at the dinner table, and I actually remembered them. He even took me to his wine tasting sessions, and that's how he discovered I was gifted with a great sense of smell and taste buds. Even James was impressed with my talent and said I was born to work in this industry after letting me taste some samples. The next step in the process was much harder than I thought. It took me a whole day to memorize all the different varieties of grapes and how to sort them, but I still messed it up. How come there are so many ripe stages? I was frustrated and was about to leave when Karen, my instructor, called me back. You have to take it slow. Wine takes time and we have to be patient. Okay, fine, I'll try. As I was sorting, I got to chat with the workers and it turned out they were quite friendly and even helped me out a lot. It was true that these workers really treated this place like their home and cherished it here. It had been more than two weeks and I was harvesting the new crop with everyone. Thanks to the tips in Dad's notebook, with a pinch of my own creativity to it, James and I were in the process of creating a new line of wine. I was confident that this would help revive the winery. I was checking stuff in the cellar when James rushed in with a leaflet in his hand. Hey Dakota, this is our chance. Wow, so this town was hosting an upcoming wine festival. If our winery could win something, we could gain lots of orders for this season. The next morning, I prepared all the documents to register for the King of Wine contest. While waiting for the interview, I strolled through the showroom and tasted the previous winning wines. Wow, they all have unique tastes. Since I had my eyes closed to appreciate the wine layers, I bumped into a handsome guy and accidentally spilled red wine on his shirt. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No biggie, it's just a small stain. Oh my, he was such a gentleman, which made me feel even more guilty. I was about to ask for his contact so I could make it up for him later when the organizer called me for the interview. My eyes were just looking away from him for a sec and he'd already gone. Anyway, it was a blessing the interview went well, and our winery was eligible for the contest. I decided to treat myself to a coffee before heading back, but at the <gasps> counter, I realized I didn't have any money on me. Oh no. I... I forgot my wallet. I'll pay for that. Wait, it's him. The guy I spilled the wine on. Turns out, he's Danny, and he might be young, but he's in fact a skilled wine critic who even held the position of vice president of the city's wine association. More surprisingly, he's a fan of my dad's and adores the wines he created. After chatting with him, I came back to the farm to tell everyone the good news. They were all very excited and started preparing for the competition right away. Two weeks before the competition, the organizing committee sent over a few people to do some preliminary assessments. And guess what? Danny was also here, being a part of the inspection team. So, after the inspection, I invited Danny to stay and share some knowledge about wine brewing. And fortunately, he's free for a few days and was pleased to stick around. Yay! I excitedly told James the great news, but he responded with no interest. That's not exactly good news. Hmm, why? Oh, I see. You're jealous of him, aren't you? What? Me? Jealous? What does he even have for me to be envious about? Well, he's handsome and also exceedingly knowledgeable about wine. And people seem to like him. Wait, where are you going? I haven't finished. 
Whatever. No one needs him. As we have Danny here now. Such a charming gentleman. <sighs> for the next two days, Danny kept trying to make time for me. Yes, just the two of us. Gosh, he's so romantic. I could spend hours with him. Dakota, you're the most special girl I've ever met. Hey, dinner time. Ugh, another would-be perfect moment ruined by James. He seemed to go out of his way to come between us. He sat in between us in the dining room, saying it was his favorite seat. Then, he followed us into the vineyard and said he was checking the quality of the grapes at 11 p.m. For real? Such a third wheel, and he's so cranky toward Danny. Hello, the guy's trying to help us here, so why the grumpy attitude? Later that night, I was passing by the kitchen when I overheard James and his dad. Should we start now? Definitely. The big day is coming up, or else we won't make it. Dakota is busy being all lovey-dovey with that jerk. She doesn't need to know this. What? Are they planning something behind my back? And then, something absolutely horrible happened the next day. When Danny and I arrived at the cellar to pick up the competition wine, we stepped into a sauna. What is this? Why is the wine cellar so hot? Someone must have tampered with the room temperature. I rushed to check the wine. Oh no, the heat had removed the last two notes and made it too sour. I fell to the ground and started sobbing. Danny tried to comfort me. He told me not to worry as he'd introduced some big clients to me, then he had to leave to prepare for the upcoming competition. I looked at the barrels in sorrow, but then remembered something. My dad also set the heat too high once and found a way to filter and ferment it again to tone down the sour flavor. I'm sure it's somewhere in the notes he left. I hurried back to my room to search through the wooden box, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Someone definitely was messing with me. Oh my god, who else could it be? The conversation between James and his dad came to mind, so I furiously went to look for him. Seeing James, I couldn't control my anger and shouted, It's you, isn't it? You adjusted the wine cellar temperature. You stole my father's notebook. You've been planning to sabotage me for a long time, haven't you? James acted confused, but before the snake could blurt out anything, I stopped him and said, Get out of here, now! He gave a defeated nod, then left without a word. Tomorrow is the day of the contest, yet I don't have any wine to enter. I picked up the letter my father left me and felt like a loser. Maybe I'm just not fit for this. Right at this moment, James pushed the door open. Dakota, look! I told you to leave! Ignoring my words, James calmly poured a glass of wine and told me to try it. Oh, this actually tastes pretty good. It's the new one you created. I stayed up a few nights and fixed its sacred taste. Now we can take it to the contest. I yelped out in joy, then lunged to hug a surprised looking James. Look at his face, red as a tomato. <laughs> but remembering how sketchy he was in the kitchen the other night, I quickly let go of him and calmed down. First things first, we had to hit the road now to participate in the competition. Our wine stall attracted a lot of guests and got highly praised by all the judges. When Danny saw us, I noticed how surprised he seemed by my presence with this new wine. I didn't expect the technique of filtration and fermentation could change the flavor so amazingly. You're really talented, Dakota. Let's take some time to discuss this in more detail later. I happily agreed, but isn't that technique recorded in my dad's notebook? How did he know it? I left the bar and sneakily followed Danny. Then in a hidden corner, I overheard him talking to someone. I've adjusted the seller's heat to destroy everything, but who knew she'd use her father's technique to fix it? I've already taken the notebook away, but she probably remembered them all. Whatever the reason is, her wine is becoming a strong rival. The championship is at stake. Can you just do something? So, have I been trusting the wrong person? Well, that hurts. But I'll sure make him pay for that. I quickly submitted the recording to the judges, and immediately there was an announcement to pause, and the wines were regraded by blind tasting to be fair. And you know what? The new wine I created won the third prize. Okay, so the prize money wasn't as grand, but it'd help us get a decent amount of orders for the next year's crop. I happily went to the podium to accept the award, and almost fainted on stage because the awarder was no one other than my dad. I hugged him and sobbed uncontrollably. It turned out that my father was not bankrupt. He just donated all his assets to charity. His plan to pretend bankruptcy was just to help me become more independent and walk on my own feet. 
It's unbelievable, but I'm not mad at him for it. On the contrary, I feel very fortunate that my father did that to give me a chance to grow up. As for Danny, he was kicked out of the City Wine Association. <laughs> That's the price to pay for his caddishness. He deserves it. And James, it turns out that the conversation between him and his father was just about fixing the wine as the two of them discovered the spoiled wine way before I did. Now, the vineyard is my first career, just like it was my dad's. This place is my home, and the workers are my family. Yep, this even includes this cold cranky guy. She's so pretty, just like a real-life Barbie. I wish my hair was as shiny and blonde as hers. This is what people think of me. But all I ever wanted was just to be a normal teenage girl, like everyone else. You see, ever since I was little, I stood out with my platinum blonde hair and turquoise eyes. People have always said I look like a Barbie. Hey, some of them even call me Barbie. My mom's always been super proud of my looks. She used to put me in princess dresses and sign me up for kids' talent shows, which I more often than not... One, this led to media attention, and soon, I was invited to model for some big brands. Back then, I was super excited about this. I loved all the praise and pampering, but unexpectedly, it was that early fame that made me gradually lose my freedom. Nora, go get dressed. Quickly, I'm not showing up late for Anna's party. Yes, Mom, I replied as I reluctantly grabbed the clothes my mom had laid out on my bed. Nora... Your natural hair is so beautiful. Before I even had a chance to reply, Mom was in there bragging about my natural blonde hair. Natural? Yeah, right. So it has nothing to do with the fact Mom makes me bleach it once a month? <laughs> she made a huge deal a few months ago when she noticed my hair beginning to slightly darken. Then Mom dragged me from person to person, boasting to them about my achievements. Ugh! This was so tedious. So, when she was absorbed in convo with some guy, I sneaked over to the food table and grabbed a slice of cake. I was about to put it in my mouth when suddenly, from behind, my mother's stern voice resounded, Nora, put that down this instant. Huh? It's just a small piece of cake. I was hardly going to balloon up after eating it. Then without giving me time to argue, she snatched it out of my hand and said, Eat that, and you'll have to skip dinner and do cardio for one hour to burn all those calories off. Do you still want it? Jeez, there's no point arguing with mom. So I grabbed my drink and went to the corner of the room. I was fiddling with my glass and feeling totally fed up when suddenly a guy came up to me and almost caused me to spill my drink. Oh my god, it's Philip, the hottest teen model in the scene right now. Sorry, um, are you Nora? I've heard a lot about you, but why are you standing here all alone? Ah, it's because I'm not really into parties like this. So we're the same. Then we started chatting, and before Philip left, he asked for my number. After that, he texted me every evening. Talking to him was so much fun. He was just so sweet and thoughtful, and he always sent me the funniest memes. How cute. One day, while we were chatting, he texted me, Can I invite you to dinner? Let's say, tomorrow evening. Ah, oh, was he asking me out on a date? Yay! But I had to ask Mom's permission first. Ugh. Mom, do you remember Philip, who we met at Anna's birthday party? Can I go to dinner with him tomorrow? Sure, I'll, I'll drive you there. No need, Mom. Philip will pick me up. No, I said I'll take you. No matter what I said, Mom still insisted. And if I didn't follow, she wouldn't let me go. Jeez. This was a date, not a fashion show that required a manager. The next evening, as soon as I walked down the stairs, my mom was at it again. Oh, my, what are you wearing? Before I had a chance to reply... Mom pulled me into my room, took out a bodycon dress, and said, You put so much effort into looking this way, so you may as well flaunt it. Besides, dating this boy could bring business deals for us. Gosh, I get it now. All this was just about fame and money. There Philip was, 
I quickly fixed my hair, then I confidently walked towards him. But when I had just sat down, before I could even greet him, out of nowhere my mother appeared and asked the waiter to arrange another chair for her. Philip gave me this bewildered look, but I didn't know what was going on either. Mom, what are you doing? We've always been together. You don't mind if I sit here, do you? Uh, uh no, not at all. <laughs> Philip smiled awkwardly. Ugh, this was so embarrassing. When the waiter appeared with the menus, I was actually glad of the distraction. But, oh no, I didn't even have the chance to open the menu, but Mom had already finished ordering for us both. Grilled salmon with salad and no dressing. Ugh, how boring. Oh, but it gets worse. During dinner, my mom kept asking Philip questions like, What do your parents do? Oh, they only run a small business. I thought they were the presidents of a corporation or something. It's unbearable. Stop it. It's none of your business. I was just asking. A flustered-looking Philip made up some excuse about having to do something. Then he left. That's it. Thanks to my mom, my first date completely failed. Frustrated, I left right after he did. I didn't say a word to mom for the whole journey home. Things didn't end there, though. When we arrived home, she kept nagging about how I shouldn't hang out with Philip as he wouldn't be of any use to my career. Don't you think you're being too much? I can date whoever I want to. You know what? I don't want you to be my manager anymore, and I'll be moving out on my own. Then I rushed back to my room and started packing. Honey, I was just worried about you. I'm sorry, she said and hugged me while sobbing. Please, don't leave me like your dad did. I can't live without you. Hearing that, my heart fell. She was right. Ever since Dad left, there was only her taking care of and loving me. She's a bit tough and over-controlling, yet she meant well, right? I texted Philip a few times to apologize, but he didn't reply. Nora, look straight. Nora, where has your charisma gone? Let's take a short break. What's going on? You seem distracted today. I sighed and started telling Eleanor about my date with Philip. Gosh, your mom's a total control freak. You need to be strong and stand up against her to win your freedom. Well, of course I wanted freedom, but where should I start? Suddenly my phone beeped and stopped my train of thoughts. It was mom. Honey, Anna's sick, so I'm staying at hers tonight. Dinner's in the fridge, and don't forget to go on the treadmill an hour before bed. Love you. Yay. Tonight I'd be free and do whatever I want. So suddenly, I came up with a brilliant idea. Yes, I was going to have a slumber party. Eleanor suggested we should order pizzas, and of course everyone excitedly agreed. So good. Suddenly, the door opened. My eyes widened in horror when I saw that it was my mom, and oh boy, she looked furious. Nora, what on earth are you doing? And you can guess the rest. She made all my friends leave, and worse, she forced me to wake up at 5 a.m. to work out. All this just because of a bite of pizza. Eleanor was right. I needed to put a stop to this by finally standing up to her. This is unbearable. So, as a stress reliever the next day, I decided to do something I always wanted. Wow, it's so cute. I know, right? It feels good to do what I want for a change. Nora? Why are you here? How come you didn't answer any of my calls? Startled, I turned around to see my mother standing there glaring at me. I quickly covered the tattoo on my wrist with my other hand, but it was too late. Nora, how dare you get a tattoo without my permission? Get back in there and get it removed right away. No, mom. My body, my choice. From now on, I'll make decisions about my own life. Everyone on the street stopped to look at us. Seeing that, Mom just glared at Eleanor, then dragged me over to the car. But how did she know I was at the tattoo studio? Right at that moment, my phone buzzed with an unknown AirTag device nearby. Wait, could it be? I quickly checked my stuff and oh my god, it's true. Mom had stuck an AirTag into a hidden corner of my bag. 
why did you attach an air tag to my bag? So I'm aware when you do stupid things like tarnishing your body with some awful tattoo. As soon as possible, you're getting it removed. I'm 18. I can do what I want. Eleanor was right. You just want to turn me into a puppet to control. I knew it. Nora, I forbid you to hang out with that girl ever again. She's jealous of you and wants to ruin your career. She just wanted to help me. Your behavior isn't acceptable. And she pulled me into my room and locked the door. You can stay there until you see sense. I banged on the door and shouted till my voice was hoarse, but it was no use. Three days passed. Mom still brought me food, but she refused to let me out. Oh no. Did she want to keep me here forever? I hurriedly called Eleanor for help, but it didn't work. Why didn't she answer the phone? Then suddenly I saw an article reporting that a model had spoken up about how Eleanor had been tricking her to steal her vedette spot for a famous designer's upcoming show. And that model was... Me? Impossible. That did not happen at all. And I have not been in contact with the press. Then a thought crossed my mind. Mom? That's right. As my manager, she must have said this to the media to defame Eleanor. Meanwhile, Eleanor must think it was me who did all this. Ugh, no wonder she was ignoring my calls. Angry and disappointed with Mom's behavior, I decided to confide in my Twitter. Unexpectedly, after only 20 minutes, my post was shared quickly and the hashtag RescueNora was at the top of the search. But then my mom angrily came in and confiscated my phone. Don't expect someone to come here and save you. The next morning, I was awoken by loud noises from outside. Huh? What was going on? I went to the window and saw a crowd of people holding signs, saying free Nora and let Barbie out. But wait a minute. I spotted some familiar faces. Eleanor and Philip. They were holding a big sign saying, we want to see Nora. Finally, under the pressure of the crowd, Mom was forced to release me. Honestly, I was grateful to the people who supported me, especially Eleanor and Philip. Thanks to them, I dared to finally break my mom's unreasonable control and grip and be myself. So, I decided to move into my own place. As for my mom, ugh, I want to forgive her, but it's hard. I just hope she realizes what she did was wrong. Then we can try to rebuild our relationship. Oh, and one more thing. From now on, I won't bleach my hair. Just to get doll hair like before. I decided to keep my natural hair color. It may affect my modeling career, but so what? It's my natural hair, and I like it. Anyway, as you can see, life's good, as I have my BFF Eleanor and my boyfriend Philip by my side. I can't believe I'm standing here in the middle of this frenzied concert with a crowd of crazy fans cheering for this Isaac guy, who I don't even care about. Hi. I'm Hazel, by the way. When I agreed with my friends to go on this road trip all the way to Carolina to attend a skydiving festival, well, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Yeah, that's them, Ivy and Zoe, the girls who tricked me into thinking this, their idol's concert, was the opening of the festival. There I was, eagerly awaiting some amazing aerial display or something, but instead, I was stuck in Fanville. Ugh were they so loud? My hearing better not be permanently damaged from this. And as you can see, being the only calm one here, they placed me in charge of their fan cams. Worse still, why did I specifically order these custom matching hoodies for us all? It made me look like I was part of these groupies. Finally, this din was over, but I was stuck amongst the slow walking fans. And where were my friends? I couldn't even call them as my battery had died. Hmm, I'll just get a taxi back to our Airbnb rental, then contact them from there. I'm too exhausted anyway. Let's just get out of this place ASAP, forget about this chaotic night, as I'll be having a bird's eye view of the world at the actual Fall Fest tomorrow. And that's all that matters. Wow, this festival had everything going for it. From attentive service, amazing live music, and great food 
was so worth enduring that awful concert for. Everything was going great, until I saw Ivy's panicked face. Girls, it's our beloved Isaac. After the concert last night, he disappeared with a mysterious girl. Look at this hoodie. Does it seem familiar to you? Oh my god, that's one of our custom-made group hoodies. Could it be? I could clearly see Zoe's suspicious gaze on me and Ivy. What's that look for? Are you suspecting me? Well, whatever. It wasn't me, that's for sure. Ivy, you took way too long to get back to the car last night. As for you, Hazel, you were unreachable for ages. Jeez, my battery died. I told you both this. And I have nothing to do with your precious idol. Besides, if any of us did run away with him, then we'd hardly be standing here, would we? Anyway, you two can stay here and doubt each other if you want, but I'm going skydiving. Then I stormed off. It's so frustrating that I've been dragged into this. My phone only died thanks to their stupid fan cams. That's enough. <sighs> Let's just forget about it. I won't let anything ruin this moment. Guys, look! I'm amongst the clouds! 10,000 feet above the ground and my breath is literally taken away. No matter how many times I've done this, it still feels just as thrilling as the first time. This adrenaline rush was crazy! Whoa, that was amazing! Thank goodness I managed to capture some spectacular footage of the beautiful city of Chester. Hang on. When I was close to landing, my camera spotted a familiar face. Zoe. Um, wasn't she meant to be preparing to fly? So why was she talking to someone in the parking lot? It was really weird. Looking closer, the strange man was... Isaac, the missing singer! I didn't see it wrong, did I? I immediately called Ivy and we quickly ran to the parking lot. Gotcha! You better have a good reason for this. Isaac, are you really... So, you're the one who ran away with him last night? Zoe couldn't say a word at that point and kept trying to avoid eye contact with us. But eventually, under the harsh questioning from Ivy, she found her voice and told us everything. So, last night, when we were separated in the after-concert chaos, Zoe was trying to find us when she accidentally bumped into a guy in disguise. Guess what? Yep, it was none other than Isaac McGuire in the flesh! She almost screamed out his name, so he immediately covered her mouth and dragged her away. Realizing that Isaac was being chased, Zoe then put her hood up to cover her face and followed him without a question. This hectic schedule was just too much. I can't even remember the last time I had proper time for myself anymore. I need a break. Ugh, and I didn't care. But Ivy sure looked like she was going to drop a tear for her poor idol any second now. Well, you see? It's an emergency. I couldn't help but give him a hand. Then, we've already parted ways last night, but... But my manager has been able to track me down, so we had to run away ASAP. All I have with me is this phone, so I really need your help. And that's when we start to hear some whispers. Someone seemed to have recognized Isaac, so without delay, we immediately jumped into the car. But, huh? Who on earth was sitting next to me? Jeez, this girl's makeup was so flashy, and her perfume was so strong it made my throat lump up. Siren! You're Siren, aren't you? Oh, I adore your chemistry with Isaac in the movie. It's like you guys were born for each other. But, wait, are you two running away together? It turned out that the flamboyant girl was Siren, an emerging actress who was filming a movie with Isaac. Looking at the way she blushed while Isaac remained silent and didn't deny it, it was clear that they were a couple who took their romance off screen. Hmm, busy schedule? Exhausted? Nonsense. Obviously, he was just making excuses to spend time with his girlfriend. Oh my, you're even more beautiful in real life. Your face is a gift from heaven. OMG, Ivy needed to stop. Looking at Siren's smug face, she was clearly big-headed enough without any more flattery. But nope, Ivy continued gushing out a river of compliments at her. I mean, does she seriously like this actress that much? Um, your nose is so pretty from up close. Where'd you get your nose job? Hearing that, 
Siren immediately stopped smiling and covered her nose in annoyance, which almost made me burst out laughing. Chin shaving surgery, lip filler, nose job, how can she even act with such a stiff face? Sorry to bother everyone, but staying at a hotel is not a good idea right now. Can you guys help us find alternative accommodation? Yes, yes, yes. I volunteer to help you two. I watched in disgust as Ivy and Zoe frantically called and texted their acquaintances, but no one could help. Suddenly, Ivy turned to me and gave me her puppy dog eyes look. Hazel, you're our last hope! You must help us, please! Oh, not that again. Ivy knows I can't say no to her when she makes that pleading face. Okay, fine. Even though I didn't want to, I agreed to let them come to my family's suburban house for a few days. It'll only be a few days. I didn't want any of my family members to know I'd been there. Wow, I can't believe I hadn't been here in 10 years! This place held some of my childhood's good memories, but also some not-so-good ones. Especially one haunting one. <sighs> um, why didn't you tell us that your family is loaded? It would be so nice to live in a huge mansion like this. But it seems like your family doesn't come here often. It's so cold and cheerless. Yeah, he's right. Ever since that day, this place was never a home to me anymore, but just a hollow house of gloom. I was still lost in my thoughts when a deafening sound of something breaking came from upstairs. We all rushed upstairs to see what all the noise was about, and found Siren standing there in my parents' bedroom, a broken vase at her feet, and worse still, she was wearing my mom's dress! Take it off right now! Siren just shrugged, stepped over the broken vase pieces, then strutted across the room, and even stopped to pose at the end. Puff! It's just an old dress! Why so serious? I was so furious that on her walk back, I tripped her up, causing her to fall flat on the floor. Isaac hurriedly helped her up, and she hid behind his back and did her whole crocodile tears act, saying I was picking on her. Oh, please. I'd had quite enough of this drama queen for one day, so I was about to lunge at her to teach her a lesson, but Isaac blocked me. Excuse, Siren. That was immature of her, but... I suggest you should calm down first. That's right, Hazel. The two of them didn't bring any personal belongings. Anyway, Siren was just a bit careless. You'd better watch your girlfriend closely. Change your clothes. Never touch my mom's stuff again. Got it? Now I'll arrange the rooms for all of us. Well, there were only two usable bedrooms here, since most of them were dusty and unfurnished. So I took the couch and gave one room to my friends and the other room to the loving couple. But as Siren gave a satisfied look and took Isaac's hand to lead him to their room, he just shook her away and said I could have the bed, and he'd take the couch. No, the couch is mine! I didn't want to share a bed with her! But Isaac ignored my protests and plopped down onto the couch to claim it. Zoe and Ivy quickly scurried upstairs. They caused this mess, yet it's clear neither of them was bold enough to share a room with Siren. What a bunch of annoying, obnoxious celebs. Anyway, I was exhausted. It was time for me to hit the sack. That girl better not snore. Siren started playing some dumb white noises, then instantly fell asleep. Me, on the other hand, even after turning off that weird lullaby of hers, I kept on tossing and turning. Ugh. It was no use. Sleep wasn't happening. So, I left the room to get some air. I was about to go downstairs to get some water when I heard a piano playing. Oh, heart and soul. It had been so long since I'd heard these beautiful melodies. The music carried me to a room where the silhouettes of a man passionately playing the piano came into sight. Oh, memories. I loved nothing more than sitting next to my dad and playing happy songs with him, but then, everything fell apart, and I hadn't touched the piano since, well, <sighs> until today. I sat down next to him and let my fingers glide over the keys. I was immersed in the harmonious melodies of the music and let the notes take me back to the past, 
until a scream snapped me out of it. What on earth are you two doing? Ah. Uh, now, what better way is there to spend a Saturday afternoon than lying on the couch watching a feel-good movie with lots of snacks? Ugh. I suppose I better get that. O-M-G. Who is this? He's the most gorgeous boy I've ever seen in my life! I stared at him in open-mouthed amazement, but then I saw him gazing back at me and realized I needed to say something. Hey, how may I help you? Hi, I'm Jaden. My mum and I have just moved in next door. Oh, in that case, welcome to the neighborhood. Jaden smiled as he held a box out to me. Well, was this a gift for me? Already? I took it from him and blushed out a thanks. I opened the box and saw that it was full of delicious-looking cookies. My mom baked them. She finds that people tend to be far more welcoming when it involves cookies. We chatted for a bit longer. Then he said he had to go and help his mom unpack. Aww, why did this moment have to end already? The next day at school, I couldn't wait to find my bestie Stella and tell her about my drop-dead gorgeous neighbor. But as it happens... She found me at my locker and immediately started gushing about this hot new boy. Hmm, I needed to see how handsome this guy was. My chance came at lunchtime when Stella pointed over at the new boy who was currently being pestered by Anna, this stuck-up girl from class. I squinted my eyes. O-M-G. The hot new boy was none other than Jaden. I watched on as Anna fluttered her eyelashes at him, then flicked her hair behind her back. Ugh. She needed to give the flirting a break. It was so tragic. Suddenly, Jaden saw me, smiled, then hurried over to me. Hi, Laura. Oh boy, am I glad to see you. He leaned in close to my ear and whispered, That girl is kind of freaking me out. Please, can we get out of here? Then to my surprise, he took my hand and led me away. I could see the shocked look on Anna's face, and I couldn't help but smirk back at her. Ha! Huh, take that, Anna. He's holding my hand, not yours. Then after school, Jaden and I walked home together. Turns out, as well as being the hottest guy on the planet, he was also really sweet and funny. <sighs> back home, I saw Jaden's mom. Cynthia watering her window box. On seeing us, she waved us over, then insisted on inviting me inside for homemade lemonade. We all got on so well. Looks like I'm going to have a boyfriend soon, one whose mom loves me. <laughs> From then onward, Jaden and I hung out lots. We had lunch together, we went to the library together, and always walked home together. I was pretty sure the girls at school were super jealous, especially Anna. One day, during P.E., the teacher told us we were playing dodgeball and assorted us into two teams. Anna, who was on the opposite side, wouldn't quit aiming at me. I tried my best to dodge her throws, but bang! She got me! Now, listen to me. Guys like Jaden don't like ordinary girls like you. He's mine. So quit chasing him! Furious, I yelled. I'm not chasing him! He's already my boyfriend! Um, actually, not. Yet, I was pretty sure Jaden liked me, too. Just you wait. He'll soon tire of you and come running to me. Ugh. Anna was so annoying. I needed to get my frustrations off my chest, so I ranted to Stella about her. Forget Anna. No one likes her anyway. As for Jaden, it's obvious he likes you. He's just new here and probably feels too shy to ask you out. Yeah, you're probably right. He must just be shy. But, ugh, I know Anna won't quit chasing him. Then you should make your relationship with Jaden official. Stella had a point. If Jaden was too shy to ask me out, then maybe I should take the initiative. Then Anna would have no choice but to back off. Ha! Huh. Tonight was the night, so I texted Jaden, 
I need your help with something. Let's meet at 8 p.m. by the slide in the park. But then he messaged back saying he couldn't meet tonight as he had to help his mom with something. Right that moment, my dad arrived home earlier than usual and announced that he was taking me and my sister Megan out for dinner. Ooh, this restaurant looked nice. I walked in alongside Megan and... Huh? What were Jaden and his mom doing here? Then my dad walked over to Cynthia, kissed her on the cheek, and said, Hello, honey. Jaden and I shared astonished looks. Then we peered at the adults for an explanation. Laura? Megan? This is Ms. Green, the lady I told you about. What? I mean, I knew Dad was dating a woman named Ms. Green, but I had no idea she was Jaden's mom. Then, before we knew what was happening, Dad got down on one knee and pulled out this diamond ring and asked her to marry him. And you know what? She said yes! Oh, no. No, 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 no! They can't marry! Because then Jaden will be my brother! Megan looked delighted and hugged them both, while I stared at Jaden in bewilderment. Don't get me wrong, I really want my dad to be happy, but why her? And what about me and Jaden? After that, Cynthia seemed to always be at our house, baking cakes, humming while she dusted and cleaned up, and exchanging gooey looks with my dad. Ew. Then one day, she insisted that Megan and I went wedding dress shopping with her. She tried on this one dress, and yeah, okay, she looked pretty good in it. But when she asked me what I thought about it, I just shook my head and said, well, it's not very flattering, is it? She tried on several more dresses, but I managed to find fault with them all. Then, when I noticed how disheartened she looked, I patted her shoulder and said, Don't worry, Cynthia. You can always postpone the wedding until you find a suitable dress. She looked a bit taken aback, but then she just smiled at me and said, That's okay, Laura. I'm going to go with the first one. Ugh. Anyway, now the dress was chosen, so at least I could go home now, right? Wrong. As on the way home, we passed an arcade. Cynthia led us there and then excitedly challenged me to a game of air hockey. Then I said jokingly, Fine, I'll play, but if you lose, you don't deserve to be my mother. And guess what? She won! Ugh! And worse still, Megan wouldn't quit giving me dirty looks for the comments I'd made. Jeez, I was just joking. What is wrong with you today? I plopped down on the couch and blurted out everything. She'd take my side, right? Um, turns out, no, she wouldn't. What? You and Jaden aren't even official. But Dad loves Cynthia. They both deserve happiness. So stop being a brat about it. Then she stormed off to her room. Ugh, I feel like I'm going crazy. I have huge feelings towards Jaden, and I know he feels the same. So why can't my sister be mature enough to understand that and support me? I needed to vent to someone. Luckily for me, I had Stella. Why does no one care about my feelings? I can't be Jaden's sister. Um, sorry, Lara. I don't know what to say. Suddenly, from the nearby table came a lousy voice. So that's the reason why Jaden has to hang out with you? You're pathetic, Lara. Turns out we were so lost in conversation, we didn't notice Anna and her flock sitting at the table behind us. Actually, we've been into each other for ages. It's not our fault our parents made some dumb decision. Anyway, whether we can be together or not, it doesn't change the fact that you bore him so much that he'd choose watching paint dry over being with you. How dare you! She was about to grab my hair, but right at that moment, a hand stopped her. It was Jaden! That afternoon, on our walk home, I finally came clean to Jaden. I like you a lot. I have always been since I first met you. I know you like me too, but 
you think it'll be awkward because our parents are getting married. Maybe if we just tell- Laura, you're such a sweet girl. And I do like you. But just as a sister. What? How could he say that to me? He had to like me. Didn't he? Feeling an unexplainable amount of shame and embarrassment, I ran away from him. As I lay on my bed and rubbed my tear-stained eyes, all I could think about was how unfair this was. So, by the time Dad called me down for dinner, and I walked in and saw how happy he looked, my anger got the better of me and I yelled, I hate you, and I hate Cynthia! How dare you try and replace Mom! Then I rushed back to my room. You really upset Dad. You know that, right? I didn't answer. I was also upset, but no one seemed to care about my feelings. Dad said we come first, so if you really feel this strongly about it, then he'll cancel the wedding. To be honest, I'm real mad with you right now. So? What about me? You're so immature and selfish! I didn't understand how my own sister could be so uncaring. So I screamed out. So what? You don't care that mom's being replaced by some fake woman? And what about me? Why does no one care how I feel? Oh my god, Laura, for once, this isn't about you! Megan rolled her eyes at me, then stormed off. Finally, everyone quit going on about the stupid wedding. But why didn't I feel good about this? Cynthia didn't seem to be coming round to our house anymore, and I noticed how Dad's cooking seemed to get worse and worse, until he stopped altogether and just ordered takeout. Meanwhile, Jaden wasn't anywhere to be seen at school. Stella asked around to find out where he was, and turns out he'd left, as he was moving back to his old town. No way! After school... I rushed straight over to his house and barged inside to find him and his mum packing. Are you... moving away? (sighs) Yeah. I moved here to settle down and start a new life with Randall. And this house is for Jaden's future. But the wedding's been cancelled, so... I quickly asked Jaden if we could talk outside. My mom's cried so much. Randall's her soulmate and she can't stay around here if she can't be with him anymore. The most annoying part is that she agrees with him that the kids must come first. So, I hope you're happy now? Oh my god, what have I done? His words were like a stab to my gut. Oh no, this was all my fault. I was so obsessed with Jaden that I didn't stop to think about what was best for everyone else. Without saying another word, I ran back home and burst into the kitchen where Dad was drearily staring into his iced coffee. Dad, you deserve to be happy with Cynthia. So, please go and tell her how you feel before she leaves for good. But it was too late. Cynthia and Jaden had gone. Just kidding! (laughs) Nah, actually, Dad managed to catch Cynthia just in time, and he told her how much he loves her, and can't live without her. So, guess what? Yep, they got married, and now they're both happier than ever. I've learned the hard way that being selfish and inconsiderate of other people's feelings for my own gain just makes everyone miserable, including myself. So, now we're one big happy family. And I suppose having Jaden as a brother isn't actually so bad after all. I was completely immersed in this beautiful harmony that me and my dad were playing, until- What on earth are you two doing? Startled, I turned around to see Siren standing there with fiery eyes. Oh god. I came back to my senses at once and realized that next to me, the man I was jamming with was not my dad, but Isaac, her boyfriend. Oh no, what had I done? I quickly wiped my tears away and was about to leave. But Isaac took my hand and gave me this confused look. B, 
being back here in this house was difficult enough without getting involved in this love triangle, so I tried to pull my hand free and ran out of there. Yes, it's me again, Hazel. In the last part of my story, my friends embroiled me into helping their idol Isaac and his actress girlfriend Siren escape from the public eye for a bit. Now I'm stuck in my family's old home and having to confront my past. All these memories flooded my mind. Some good, some bad. And before I knew it, I was mixing the past with reality. And that's how I accidentally played the piano with Isaac and made Siren green with envy. At that moment, Siren swung open the door and charged toward me. Hey, don't let me catch you flirting with my BF again. Excuse me, what did you say? He's not even my type. Besides, having you as a love rival sounds like way more hassle than it's worth. She gave me this lingering scowl. Clearly she was furious with me, but she must have decided there was nothing else she could say on this matter. However, this didn't stop her from being the most demanding, frustrating diva on the planet. She stuck her nose up at the food and drinks we served her and insisted that she couldn't possibly consume anything that wasn't organic. She threw the clothes that we lent her down the stairs cause, quote, those vulgar outfits didn't suit her. Then she asked Ivy to go get her designer ones. Once, Zoe even had to drive over an hour to the mall just for a few scented candles. Why you ask? Well, Siren accused me of exuding this bad energy that had been affecting her sleep and her well-being, so she needed to cleanse the aura around here. Poof, this was nonsense. Once her head touched the pillow, she slept like a log. It seems that living in the same house as their idol and his girlfriend wasn't exactly all it's cracked up to be. Isn't that right, Ivy and Zoe? However, contrary to Siren the Nightmare, Isaac surprised me quite a lot by actually being a great help around the house. He was an excellent cook and a dab hand at fixing things. Okay, I admit that I used to think he was just one of those useless celebs out there, but it seems he had no problem with pulling his weight. Anyway, this manner of his did somewhat make up for the obnoxious attitude of his girlfriend, which made this whole thing a bit more bearable. Until this one time, we were rowing on the river near the mansion. Well, I was rowing to be exact, just me, as what could we expect from our two superstars? But it's pretty out here, isn't it? It was Siren's bright idea, as she wanted some new Insta photos. You're probably wondering where Zoe and Ivy are. Yep, they're scouring the shops a few towns over for ethical foie gras. Look at her, saying she's feeling sick she couldn't row. But apparently she was well enough to smile for the camera and strike dozens of different poses. Suddenly, Siren decided to stand up to get better lighting, which made the whole boat shake. I shouted at her to sit down, but then before I properly knew what was going on, the boat was turning sideways and I tumbled into the water. I flailed my arms and legs out and tried my best to raise my head above the water, but it was no use. I couldn't stop myself from sinking beneath it. I honestly believed this was it. The world started to darken around me, when suddenly, an arm grabbed me and pulled me ashore. Hazel, can you hear me? I slowly opened my eyes and saw Isaac's worried face peering down at me. Hazel, thank goodness. He gently helped me sit up, then asked me if I was all right. For a few fleeting moments, the warmth from his body made me flush. Clearly, nearly drowning had made me delirious. I mean, I couldn't have feelings for him. Could I? Before I could ponder on this thought anymore, a drenched siren dripped her way over to us. Isaac, why did you rescue her instead of me? Siren, this is not the time for being dramatic. I was hardly going to come to you, an expert swimmer, over Hazel who was actually drowning. Hearing Isaac say that, she rolled her eyes, then stormed off, leaving a wet footprint trail in her wake. The last thing we needed in the house was more tension, so I immediately turned to him and said I was fine, and he should go and sort things out with his girlfriend. Listen, Hazel, Siren's not my girlfriend. I don't like her in that way, but as for you and me, we clearly have a connection. I stared at him in complete open-mouthed shock. Did he really just say that? Or perhaps I had a concussion and was imagining things. 
Siren's like my little sister. I'll explain this later, but first you need to rest. Then he wrapped his arms around me and guided me back to the house. I spent the rest of that day in bed feeling feverish. Then at dawn the next morning, I awoke to a commotion coming from downstairs. Guys? <sighs> What's all the noise about? It's Isaac and Siren! They've gone! And they've taken the car! What? That was our only mode of transport out of here! How could they be so selfish to just abandon us here like this? We tried contacting Isaac countless times, but no answer. Great, here we are now in this remote area where it would take hours to even find a passerby to hitchhike, not to mention how risky it'd be. Everything was a mess. We were panicking when suddenly the door burst open and walked in a smiling, arm-linked Isaac and Siren. Where have you been? You can't just leave like that without telling us. Oh, Ivy lent us the car. Didn't she say anything? Both Zoe and I turned our gazes on Ivy. She stammered. But, but I think you guys just went out for a while, not disappeared all night unreachable. Relax, all this tension will give you wrinkles. Then Siren smirked at me as she flicked back her hair and then continued. We went to a drive-in cinema and it was so romantic. We didn't want the evening to end, so we strolled around town until the early hours. What did she mean by that? So much for him seeing her as a sister. I felt like such a fool for believing his lies. We altered our entire plans to help you both hide from society, and this is how you thank us? By pulling a stunt like this? No more. Get out of here! Right now! Before anyone could say anything, my phone buzzed. It was my friend Erica. She asked me if the stories about me being in love with Isaac were true. Huh? What was she on about? In my panic, I ended the call and went online to check it out. Turns out on the Instagram account of the store where I customized our matching hoodies, the shop owner had posted a photo of me wearing it. Naturally, it didn't take the fan maniacs long to do their research and find out all about me. But worse still, another current trending post was one from Isaac's management company confirming that we were officially dating. What kind of nonsense is this? I immediately told Isaac to call his company and put it on speaker. Isaac, we hit a jackpot! You probably know the iconic pianist and composer Edward Moretz, right? Hazel Moretz is his daughter! You... you mean... Everyone gasped at me in shock. Maybe it's time for me to reveal the secrets of my past, the truth that's been hidden for so long. Yes, Edward Moretz is my father, but I made a promise to myself 10 years ago that I would never speak to him again. Isaac's manager continued to brazenly talk about how the scandal with me would benefit Isaac's career, so there was no need to hide it. At that moment, Siren shouted, What on earth are you saying? Hey, are you with Siren again? I already told you not to mess with that girl unless you want to get yourself in trouble. Shut up! Siren furiously grabbed Isaac's phone and ended the call. Isaac, tell everyone that the one you love is me, not her. Siren, we were never in love. You're going too far. What? You guys aren't dating? So we misunderstood it all from the beginning? I knew right away there was something wrong. Yet you pretended to be his real girlfriend and treated us like your minions. Siren stood there with a red face, fists clenched. I gave you my heart, but all you do is hurt me. This time you've made a big mistake, Isaac. Just wait and see. Siren left for her room, but this time neither of us stopped her or comforted her. The next morning, we found out that Siren was gone. None of us knew where she was. We all just hoped that she wasn't so fueled with anger that she'd cause us even more problems. We quickly packed our things into the car, preparing to return to our normal life. When out of nowhere, a bunch of reporters and journalists appeared and surrounded us. Isaac, Miss Sirenwild has accused Ms. Moretz of wrecking your relationship. Is this true? Does that mean you ran away from all the shows to go on a secret date with Ms. Moretz? Ms. Moretz, your father was known for breaking not only yours, but also another family apart. All for his own selfish needs. Are you following in his footsteps? Scary flashlights were everywhere. Suddenly, I found myself transported back to that terrible day 10 years ago when Dad's affair went public. 
and the reporters hounded us in this exact same spot. Those heartless flashlights are just as intense now as they were back then. A memory of my mom's distraught face popped into my mind. Puffy eyes, tear-stained cheeks, a fearful look. Yet the reporters were relentless vultures, firing questions at her regardless of her vulnerable state. That's the day I made a promise to myself that not only would I never pursue music, but I'd also never forgive my father. Amid the panic, an arm pulled me into the car, and we drove away from the crowd. It was Isaac. He put on some piano music to help calm me down, and he continued driving, eventually stopping at a small grocery store. Hazel, please drink this. Sorry for dragging you into all this. The thing is, I've been unhappy with my management company for a while now. It won't let me make the music I want to, but I didn't expect them to go as low as forcing me into their web of lies just for fame. I know how you feel. I used to long to become a pianist like my dad, but then he crushed my dreams. To further his career, he cheated on my mom with another married woman and left our family behind. I grew to hate the complex world of artists. I vowed to never become one of them. And then I gradually began to despise the sound of the piano too. I'm sorry to hear that story, but art isn't to blame. It reflects lies genuinely, doesn't it? I heard your piano melodies and you are truly gifted. Be honest with your feelings and don't let anyone else interfere with them. Trying to deny your own passion and emotions will only make you miserable. Isaac's right. I'd let my dad's mistakes alter the pathway to my dreams. Not making music made me miserable. I felt like there was a part of me missing, one that nothing else could fill. Why should I be the one to suffer like this, when it hadn't even been me that done anything wrong? Look at me now. Can you believe it? I've rekindled my passion for piano, and now I'm happier than ever. After all that runway pop star drama, Isaac left his management company and collaborated with me to make music for true art. This is our latest charity event. It's pretty neat, huh? That's all thanks to Zoe and Ivy. They work for us now. They're in charge of arranging our busy schedules and organizing our events. The four of us make the best team. I guess you're wondering what happened to Siren? Last I heard, she set her sights on her latest movie co-star. Hmm. Wish her good luck is all I can say. As for Isaac and me, well, since the media claimed that we were a couple, we might as well have turned that fake news into reality. I've never liked hospitals. Yeah, I get it, no one really does. Yet here I was sitting in the hospital waiting area, silently praying that she would be all right. Geez, I was shaking like an old dog left out in the cold. I just couldn't think straight. Why was no one telling me if she would be okay? Suddenly, a stern-faced doctor appeared and told me, Sir, the operation was a success. Your sister will be just fine. You can go through and see her now. I didn't know whether to burst into tears because of relief or to run away because of fear. Finally, I still went to see her. She blinked open her eyes, then fixed them on me, and in a groggy voice said, Who are you? I get it. My appearance unnerves people. I've never been a looker, and this scar sure doesn't help. But people will always judge. Maybe if they stop to talk to me, then I can tell them that I'm a military veteran who got it due to an accident during training. Training I was doing so I could fight to save their butts. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Now, talking about the girl in the hospital, let me continue my story. Well, it began with my evening shift as a delivery driver. I was humming along to the radio when this girl came out of nowhere and ran straight into the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late. I heard a thud. She was lying there all limp. It was horrible. For a moment, I thought she was dead and I was too scared to check on her. Suddenly, a thought of abandoning her popped up in my mind. But no, I couldn't be that heartless, so I ran to check her pulse. Phew, she was still alive. I called for an ambulance and told her help was on the way. In the hospital, the doctor said she needed emergency surgery, but they had to have a relative's consent first. The girl had no ID on her or anything. What was I meant to do? I couldn't just sit there and let her die. So I blurted out, 
I give my permission. I'm her brother. When the girl asked me who I was, well, I had no idea how to reply. The doctor concluded that she must have memory loss. So, who are you? The girl asked me again. I couldn't go changing my story now, so I replied, I'm Chelvin, your brother. Oh, hi, Chelvin. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. This girl seemed so sweet, I instantly warmed to her. It's been just me and my dog Buster for I don't know how many years. Girls usually take one look at me and run away as fast as their heeled shoes can take them. But this girl wasn't looking at me like they did. The doctors asked me what her name was, so I said Alice. That was my mother's name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I'd use my savings to pay for her hospital fees. Then I visited her every day. I thought she'd ask me about her family, friends, I don't know, everything. But nope. She just liked listening to me ramble on, mainly about Buster. When she was ready to leave the hospital, I took her back to my house. I made up the spare room and bought some new bed covers, laid some clothes out on the bed, and put some flowers in there to make it look nice. Alice seemed to like it. She smiled, told me I was sweet, then hugged me. I bet I was blushing like a beetroot. I left her there to get ready. Then I made a start on dinner. She came downstairs in this dress I'd bought at the mall for her, and oh my days, she looked like a picture. I made an excuse to go and get her a drink, so she wouldn't see how flustered I was. I thought she'd ask me stuff about her life, but she didn't. Not one question. So I decided to tell her anyway. I mean, I'd spent days making the backstory up, so I may as well share it with her. It's just you and me now, and it has been that way for a long time. Our parents passed away some years ago now. Our mom, she was called Alice too. Oh, it's a nice name, she muttered back. Do I look like her? Um, yes, you have her hair. I told her a few other things, such as how she'd just broken up with her boyfriend and was in between homes at the moment. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like she was soaking my words in and taking some comfort from them. The next day, things changed, and Alice started doing erratic things. I went downstairs bright and early to find that she'd emptied all of my kitchen cupboards and was scrubbing them clean. When I asked her what she was doing, she ignored me and carried on. It's like she was in her own bubble and couldn't hear me at all. I told myself this was probably just her way of adjusting to everything. But then her odd behavior continued. When a delivery guy knocked on the door, she leaped behind the couch. Afterward, I asked her what was up. But she said she was just looking for her lost earring. Another time, I was waiting for my favorite TV show to start, and we were both chatting on the couch. But she suddenly grabbed the TV remote, turned it off, then walked out of the room with the remote. This was normal, right? She'd been through a lot. Maybe this was a stage of her recovery? Most of the time, she was such a sweet and lovely girl. She always packed food and snacks for me to take to work, and she made such a fuss of Buster. Okay, so she still did her cupboard cleaning ritual every single morning, but hey, we all have our quirks. Having another mouth to feed meant I had to work more hours, but I didn't mind it. For once, I felt like a purpose. She helped me find the reason to live again, instead of just existing. I often took her treats home, such as cookies or Hawaiian pizza, her favorites. If I was working night shifts, she always waited up for me. It made me feel so warm inside when I arrived home and saw her sitting there with Buster. I had no money left at the end of each month, but I had something more. I had happiness. I liked this girl. I more than liked her, but I couldn't tell her this, as she thought I was her brother. I knew I needed to tell her the truth, but I just didn't know how to go about doing so. One morning, after she'd finished her cupboard cleaning and we were enjoying breakfast, I told her about the job I had on, delivering a parcel to Sherry Hill Street. Her eyes widened. Then she told me she wanted to come too. This was surprising, as she'd shown no interest in leaving the house before. I mean, she refused to even take Buster for a walk, but I agreed without questioning her. I told her to wait in the lorry while I delivered the parcel. Only when I got back, she wasn't there. I ran around the block searching for her. But then I saw a crowd and it seemed like there's a car accident. My face paled. I ran as fast as I could to see who the victim was and luckily it wasn't her. Phew. I kept looking around and finally I found her. She was sitting on the curb with her head in her hands. 
She was crying. I sat down next to her and hugged her. She might be too scared witnessing the terrible accident. Then, when she was ready, I took her home. The next morning, I went downstairs expecting to see her cleaning the cupboards, but she wasn't there. I made her some toast and a coffee and took them up to her room. She opened the door, glared at me, then said, I remember everything. I know you're not my brother. Alice, I'm so sorry. I just, I just wanted to help you. She shouted at me. My name's not even Alice. Then she stormed past me. I rushed after her and heard the door bang shut. She'd gone. So that's it. I was back to my lonely, sad life. Each day after work, I came home to see no one waiting for me. No hot meals, no laugh, nothing but a boring, empty house. Three months went by, and one day I was delivering some boxes to this rich shop owner guy. The boxes were very heavy, and one of them fell out of my arms and hit the floor. The shop guy started yelling at me, You idiot! I'm not paying you to be neglectful! But then what do I expect? You can't even look after your own face! I didn't say anything. Instead, I peered down at my feet. Then I heard footsteps, so I looked up and there she was. It was Alice. Oh no, I didn't want her to see me being scorned at like this. Suddenly, she shouted at the man. Hey, just because you have money doesn't mean you can say anything to others. Apologize to him or I will not let up on you. The man sneered and told her to go away. I couldn't deal with this, so I walked away. But Alice rushed after me and called out to me. Please, Chelvin, let me tell you the truth. I stopped walking, and that's when she told me everything. It turns out she'd never lost her memory. She faked it because she wanted to escape her miserable life. Her husband was a cruel man who cheated on her, beat her, and controlled her. He was a famous TV presenter, which is why she turned off the TV that time, as she'd seen him on there. She hid when the doorbell rang as she was terrified it'd be him, and she tidied the cupboard every morning out of habit, as if she didn't do it back home, he would beat her. What? This was crazy. I needed answers. So I asked her, so you faked regaining your memories? And that outburst, it was all a lie? Chelvin, I'm so sorry. I knew I couldn't drag you into my personal life anymore. I used to live in Sherry Hill Street. That's why I came with you. I found out my husband thought I was dead, so he married another woman. I made him sign the divorce papers and set me free. I also made him give me a payout, else I'd ruin his precious career. Then she handed me some money and told me it was to cover the expenses for when she was living with me, and that she'd also send me some money to cover her hospital fees. We hugged, and I cried like a baby. Gee, this was all too much for me. But then, to my surprise, she grinned, went to shake my hand, then said, Hey, I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, after that, thanks to her ex, Julia was able to buy a nice little house. Actually, I'm helping her renovate it. We've become pretty great friends. To be honest, just looking at her makes my stomach flip. I love her so much. I know I need to tell her. Life's far too short not to. If she says no, well, then at least I'll still have her friendship, right? I might not have model looks, but I'm a good person. Julia's taught me to realize that. I hope she says yes, but what will be will be. Wish me luck.